What the hell is going on here? Who are you? Oh, I'm a space pirate. My name is Kikade. Kikade now! Earth is currently being targeted by someone. Crossbone X2. Zabine Jaro. Launching. I'm fine, Aeronax, my boy. You just saw something you shouldn't have seen. Say farewell, you impudent little brat! You've got guts. However, I'm an Imperial pilot. You won't get away. The entire surface of the Earth will burn. <laughs> I've got you now. Well then, whatever shall I do? I could end it all in a snap, but our guests would probably not find that very satisfying, would they? For a pirate, he's pretty good. I will be his opponent. Among the giant assortment of entries in the Gundam franchise, there are some that, at least internationally, reside in a sort of a limbo, between being universally well known, such as Origin and Thunderbolt, and being niche, such as Madwang and Double Fake. Generally speaking, they have a manga, maybe a game or two, though most people in the West usually get introduced to them by being exposed to the various mobile suits and characters, making a guest appearance in the more prominent releases, such as the Gundam vs. series, Super Robot Wars, and the G-Generation franchise. These are your Gundam Sentinels, your Zionic Fronts, your Blue Destinies, and of course, the Crossbone Gundam. Unlike its more iconic peers, the Crossbone series takes place in what most people call the Late Universal Century. The Late Universal Century is admittedly an odd beast according to many, and if you're new to the franchise as a whole, it's not very likely that you've even heard of most entries within it. Well, unless you've taken this idiot's advice and hopped straight into F91. But hey, if I went on a tangent and talked about all the people whose coverage of Gundam and anime in general makes CBR writers seem competent and knowledgeable in comparison, I'd be here all day. So anyways, continuing on. The Crossbone Gundam series takes place in the year UC-0133. In the timeline, that is pretty far from the original Mobile Suit Gundam anime, so if I may, I'll catch you up to speed. Though you're more than free to skip ahead. As humanity advanced, it reached a point where living in space became a viable option and thus a new era began. Dubbed the Universal Century, it replaced the Anno Domini calendar starting the year humanity began moving into space. However, as years passed by, things were changing. In terms of technology, the Minovsky particles were discovered birthing the age of mobile suits. The Earth Federation, a political giant and essentially a global government of the Blue Planet, grew stagnant and corrupt, which gave rise to factions and movements opposing it. In the year 0079, a first major war of the Universal Century broke out. It was a clash between a faction of monarchists from the Side Free Colony that called themselves the Principality of Zeon and the Earth Federation. Events of this war are chronicled in Mobile Suit Gundam and a large amount of side stories, mangas and OVAs. Long story short, the Principality lost. Its remnants, however, remained, taking part in later conflicts in 0083, 0088 and 0090s. There were other factions that fought against the Federation, such as the Ayuk and Mafti. 
but after multiple perfect victories, even those wilted away. Which brings us to the second century of the UC era. Things have changed. The rebellion of the late Hadway Noah was burned to cinders at the shores of Australia. There is no unicorns flying around anymore, and the hegemony of once dominant Anaheim Electronics has been challenged and broken by the newcomer who bore the name of Sinri. On top of that, mobile suits got smaller. A lot smaller, in fact. Now, as some of you might know, Crossbone Gundam is a sequel to a Gundam movie by the name of Gundam F-91. It's a relatively short entry, but it does play a major role in establishing quite a few aspects and characters of Crossbone Gundam as a whole. This movie takes place in the year UC-0123 and kicks off with a badass scene where these short grey mobile suits breach into the colony, wreaking havoc and absolutely curb stomping the Federation forces stationed here. It's a nice way to set the scene and introduce the characters, albeit briefly. The colony it's taking place at is the Frontier 4 colony from the Site 4 colony cluster. See those guys beating the shit out of Feris? Well, that's the Crossbone Vanguard, a personal army of the Rona family and their faction of aristocrats. They get their mobile suits from the Buch Concern, a company that went from collecting space junk to making mobile suits. These two things will be very important later on. Going back to the civilians fleeing from the active combat zone, it's rather hard not to notice the guy with blue hair and the redhead with the two being Seabook Arno and Cecily Fairchild, respectively. They will also be important later on. Anyway, the initial attack causes the two to separate. Seabook Arno stays with the survivors and eventually stumbles upon a Federation ship where the movie's namesake, the Gundam F-91, is stationed. And Cecily Fairchild, the redhead, gets dragged off by a crossbone vanguard to go see her relatives which happened to be the Rona family. Her birth name is, in fact, Bera Rona, and her father is the Darth Vader impersonator over here. The main objective of the Rona family is to basically establish a sort of an aristocracy all over the colonies, obviously with them at the wheel, and call it the Cosmo Babylonia. However, the dollar store Darth Vader, who donned the iron mask after getting NTR'd by Theo Fairchild, has a more, shall we say, genocidal intentions. Long story short, Seabook and Cecily meet again, though this time it's on the battlefield. Seabook is in the Gundam F91 and Cecily is in her XM07 Venagina. Cecily is also joined by a blonde man with an eye patch called Zabin Sharu, a high-ranking officer within the Crossbone Vanguard, which will be important later on. In the ensuing chaos, Cecily manages to defect from the Crossbone Vanguard and rejoins Seabook. Zabin returns to the Crossbone Vanguard's flagship in the meantime, just in time to see Darth Vader clone's evil scheme. A cloud of unmanned flying saw blades is deployed from the ship flying into the colony and slaughtering anything it comes across. Seabook and Cecily try to intervene and do successfully reduce their numbers, but a bigger threat is waiting for them in space. The Rafflesia, a giant mobile armor piloted by the Dark Helmet himself. Seeing him like that, the one-eyed blondie cuts all ties with Vader, as in his eyes he went against the principles of the Rona family and by proxy the pursuit of space aristocracy that Zabin supported. During the fight with Rafflesia, the Vina Gina gets destroyed, with Cecily floating in space. But Seabook's F-91 does manage to strike the final blow and defeat the Moldo armor. The F-91 is heavily damaged, but still operational. As he's drifting in space, Seabook meets Zabin, who congratulates him and flies off. Seabook then proceeds to search for Cecily, jumping out of the F-91's cockpit and reaching her using the thrusters on his spacesuit. The two reunite once again, and the big THIS IS ONLY THE BEGINNING in all caps appears on the screen. So, 
Now that we've got the key players established, we can start the actual Crossbone Gundam proper. My plan is to cover the entire run of Crossbone in the same manner as the almighty Lolly did with his Berserk saga. However, since Crossbone is obviously far less prominent than Berserk, I am limited by what is already scanlated, so the newer entries like Dust and X11 will be covered much later. I'll also split it into multiple parts in the same way Lolly did, with a quote-unquote final cut version being a combination of all the parts made thus far. That being said, let's begin. As I've stated near the start of the video, the original 1995 Crossbone manga takes place in the year UC-0133, 10 years after the events of Gundam F91. It's written and illustrated by Yuichi Hasegawa, who previously worked on side story mangas like the Idion crossover joke series, Gigantis' Counterattack and Victory Gundam Outside Story. He has a distinctive style of drawing characters, which is also prominent in Crossbone. As for the story, it follows the now 26-year-old Sibu Garnil, who took up the moniker of Kincaid now, and his significant other Cecily Fairchild as they wage a silent war against the so-called Jupiter Empire. That's the most spoiler-free summary that I can give you. From this point onwards, there will be spoilers aplenty. So if you want to jump in spoiler free, this is your final warning. Anyways, the manga starts with a large cargo ship spotting a silhouette in the distance. It's somewhat reminiscent of the traditional 1600 galleon. It's the pirates. In a blink of an eye, a group of mobile suits rush out from the galleon. While they're obviously newer models, they have an oddly familiar shape. As they advance to the cargo ship and start engaging with its mobile suits, the ship's captain notices something even more menacing. Standing on the ship's deck at the height of 15.9 meters is the XMX-1 Crossbone Gundam. After this flashy introduction, we flash forward to another ship, though this time it's near Jupiter. Traveling on board is the 15-year-old Tobia Ernax. The kid is genuinely excited about the prospects of visiting the Jupiter Sphere, and honestly, who would blame him? Over the decades, the fifth planet has become a strategic source of helium-3, as well as a home to multiple orbiting space colonies. Tobia is one of many exchange students from the Earth's colonies that came to pay a visit, and upon arrival to a nearby space station, they were welcomed by an old Jupiter Sphere citizen who was hired as their tour guide. Of course, Tobia being a 15-year-old has other priorities than listening to the old man's rambles, and proceeds to wonder whether there are any hot chicks on Jupiter. Spoiler alert, there are. But anyways, going back to the freshly arrived exchange student, we learn that the people of Jupiter are called the Jovians, and their leader is Krax Dogati whose portrait is prominently featured in the hall. Within the crowd gathered here are some Jovian exchange students too, as well as a tall man in a suit. He seems to recognize Tobia, addressing him as my boy. As we're promptly told, his name is Professor Damien Karras, and the two seem to share some history together. Tobia regroups with the others in the cafeteria of their ship, enjoying his lunch while chit-chatting with his peers. This is a great moment since it does a decent job at elaborating on the world building while not feeling too ham-fisted. You get to see the students amazement at the planet's sheer size, their outlooks on their upcoming studies, and some rumors about Jovian mannerisms. They're generally more pedantic about using water and air, which makes sense considering it's Jupiter, not Earth. Another habit of the Jupiter's denizens seems to be wearing gloves everywhere, with one of the students interjecting that they have some sort of a hierarchical system where every citizen is given a three-digit number which is stamped on the back of their hand. One of Tobias' classmates laughs it off and tries to change the topic to chicks, but he gets interrupted by another guy reading the news. 
The headline says something about the space pirate attack, which is likely a reference to the events we've seen earlier. It is their sixth attack on a Jupiter transport and they seem to have Gundam type mobile suits. At least two of them. Some kid tries to de-escalate the mood by downplaying it as rumors and media sensationalism, but before he gets into it too much, we're introduced to another character. A little girl with blonde hair runs into the room, followed by some Jovians, yelling that she's a stowaway. As she's running at full speed, she bumps into Tobia. This obviously allows her pursuers to apprehend her. But she looks at Tobia again, asking for help and insisting that she is not a stowaway. You've probably seen this trope before, so you might have a hunch where this is going. However, before any sort of a confrontation can take place, something rather unexpected happens. The space pirates arrive. Now at this point we don't know much about the pirates or their intentions. We know that they have access to Gundams, they have attacked Jupiter's fierce ships before, and that the silly little robots flying out of their ships have something to do with their background. So, at the very least, there are some hints. To counter the pirate attack, Smashion, yeah that's the name of the Jupiter ship Tobia is on, I'm not making that up, launches a mobile suit of their own, the EMS-06 Batala. We've seen these before at the start of the chapter which somewhat confirms that the ship seen in the pirate attack from earlier was Jovian in origin. You also get to see the mono-eye camera underneath the Batala's goggles, which is pretty cool. Zaku Chad stay winning. Obviously, chaos ensues, with the Batalas piloted by Jovians clashing with the XM-08 Zondo gates that the pirates are using. Suddenly, two silhouettes pierce through the newly created battlefield. It's the Gundams. They proceed to make short work of Jupiter's mobile suits, evading their attacks with ease, closing in and hitting back twice as hard. One of the jobbers comes in for a melee attack, but before he even lands a strike, one of the Gundams, the white one, shoots out an anchor, violently grabbing him and sending the unfortunate bastard flying into the ship. The impact rocks the hull of the ship. As Tobia, now dressed in a spacesuit, tries to get the little girl out of Harp's way. During their escape, the two stumble upon an empty Jovian mobile suit. And just like every 15 year old boy in Mecha is contractually obligated to do, Tobia hops into the cockpit of the Batala and flies out of the ship, armed with a beam Gatling gun. He sets his sights on one of the Gundams and proceeds to open fire. But the Gundam's mobility makes it hard to keep up a consistent barrage. Suddenly, the white Gundam flies directly into the stream of beam shots, with Tobia rejoicing about landing a hit. But this celebration is cut short. The beam shots from his Gatling are doing no damage. In fact, the cloak like shape on the pirate's Gundam seems to be absorbing most of them. Closing in, the Gundam suddenly becomes a blur ditching the cloak and using it as a decoy, which confuses Tobia. If he's not here, he must be... Oh shit! It's close. So close that Tobia can perfectly see the skull insignia on the Gundam's head. The Gundam's face is almost grinning. Our protagonist, however, has balls of steel and actually pulls a beam saber. Considering what is in front of him, the kid has guts and even manages to parry a strike. For a moment. Let's not kid ourselves. This is a high performance machine and just like that, the Gundam slices Tobia's beam saber in half, alongside his mobile suit. However, to Tobia's surprise, the space pirate tells him to bail from the cockpit before rendering the now heavily damaged machine completely unusable. Floating in space, Tobia is baffled as to why he wasn't killed on the spot. And as he is making his way back to the ship, he notices that there's other survivors alive and well amongst the wreckage of Jovian mobile suits. For some reason, they weren't killed either. As he is now pretty close to the ship, Tobia enters through the cargo bay, walking through dimly lit corridors full of cargo. 
there's been nothing but these large cylindrical tanks. Hold up, is that poison gas? Apparently, there's a stockpile of these things, lining the tall shelves and filling the entirety of the cargo bay. Someone grabs Tobia from behind. It's Professor Karras. Tobia gets held at gunpoint, but the boy is having none of it and manages to knock the pistol away. Still baffled by the professor's behavior, he tries to make sense of all this, but the professor's reply only confirms his suspicion. Karras has been smuggling tanks of poison gas into the Earth sphere alongside the exchange students. During his struggle to get out of professor's grasp, Tobia also notices that the guy has a number on his arm before finally managing to break free. Dropping all charade, Professor Karras proceeds to inform the kid about two things. One, he works for the President Crux Dogati and Jupiter Empire. And two, he doesn't take kindly to any witnesses being alive. However, before he proceeds to reiterate on his second point, the hull is breached by a rather familiar machine with the decompression sucking the crooked professor into space. Tobia and multiple tanks of gas get dragged out of the ship as well, but before he could join the floating space debris, the Gundam's pilot jumps out of the cockpit, catching him mid-flight and pulling him into safety. The kid is still very confused about the whole ordeal, to which the space pirate does his best Morpheus impression, giving Tobia the option to go back home or to tag along see the full scale of the nefarious plans of the Jupiter Empire and fight against it. He also introduces himself as Kincaid. Kincaid now. And he fights for the Crossbone Vanguard. Mind you, all of this happens in a single chapter that's around 47 pages long. We get a brief look at the Jupiter's forces and the space pirates. A hint at what's to come and we also get some pointers about the background of the pirates, the Crossbone Vanguard, which is a faction that we've been introduced to much earlier in Gundam F91. Chapter 2 more or less doubles down on all of this, beginning on board of Mother Vanguard, the flagship of the Space Pirates. Right in the middle of the bridge, we meet the ship's captain. Yep! is the redhead from F91, Cecily Fairchild, who has taken up her Rona family birth name of Bera Rona. She also has a little parrot on her shoulder, which is pretty cute. Bera proceeds to give Tobia the same choice of two options that the Gundam pilot gave him, and after a bit of hesitation, the kid goes for the second option. That's right, Tobia Ernax is now promoted to a pirate kid. The nice pirate captain lady starts explaining what's up and we get some nice shots of the ship as well as the ship's hangar where the mobile suits are being resupplied. Some of the smaller machines are also helping out with the disposal of the gas tanks and bringing in the supplies from the Jovian space station. Smashion, the transport ship from earlier, is cleared to Sori, returning for Earth with the exchange students on board and leaving only Tobia behind. The boy thinks about his classmates, the gas smuggling endeavors of Professor Karras, what he'll do in the future and Kincaid now. The Gundam pilot from earlier interrupts his train of thought and assures Tobia that the transport is gonna make it home safe because the Jupiter Empire isn't targeting civilians, at least not yet. Then the two go peel some potatoes. In terms of the overall tone, this manga is somewhat on par with most OG Gundam entries, being equal parts serious and equal parts slapstick. In Crossbone, you get autistic space monkeys one day and near suicidal missions with heavy losses on the other. It is unapologetically Gundam, more so in the later entries. Going back to the duo, Tobia notices a crossbone vanguard patch on Kincaid's jacket, and we get a nice little catch-up for everybody not playing the home game. Ten years ago, a faction led by the Rona family started a war of independence on the colony Side 4, 
in the bids to establish their aristocratic rule. The spearhead of these endeavors was a man by the name of Maitsorona, and he led a military organization by the name of Crossbone Vanguard as his de facto army. Now his granddaughter, Bera, wasn't too fond of his ideas, and proceeded to split off, which amongst a few other things managed to stop the whole Cosmo-aristocracy movement dead in its tracks. Toby also mentions that he remembers a Gundam pilot who looked a little familiar to Kincaid. I think he's onto something. Five years after the war broke out, a giant ship by the name of Babylonia Vanguard was built, but it mysteriously vanished during its maiden flight, and many presumed that it perished in either an accident or some kind of a terrorist plot alongside the Gundam pilot and the daughter of the Rona family. So, to the outside world, they basically don't exist. After that, we cut to Bararona taking a shower. The scene itself isn't framed in any sort of a titillating manner. It's very matter-of-fact. All of a sudden, she spots a silhouette through the shower door. Meanwhile, Kincaid and Tobia are walking through one of the ship's hallways, and Kincaid admits that in its current form and with Bera at the wheel, the Crossbone Vanguard isn't really set on reviving any sort of a space aristocracy. They just use the title to gain favors, supplies and equipment in their fight against the Jupiter Empire. Sure, it might be a little deceptive, but he is interrupted by Barrow yelling out his name and the noise of a plastic ball hitting some unfortunate soul. At roughly the same time, Barrow runs out of the shower, still with the impression that the intruder was Kincaid, but stops upon noticing that there's another person right next to Tobia. Turns out, the blonde girl from a while ago hid in the shower earlier. She isn't really beating those stowaway accusations anytime soon, is she? The girl introduces herself as Bernadette Briette, and for some reason, she's on the run from the Jupiter Empire. Tobia tries to persuade the ship's captain about keeping Bernadette on board, and the captain reluctantly agrees. Under one condition, he has to babysit the fresh addition to the crew. There's a call from the bridge, saying something about the Meteor 202. On the way there, Kinkid and Bera briefly talk, and bring up something only referred to as that mission. I'm pretty sure you're getting somewhat sick of me saying this, but it's something that will come up later. Having spotted the meteor in question, Mother Vanguard, the ship of the space pirates, prepares for battle. Crossbone Vanguard's mobile suits launch from the ship, followed by Kincaid's white Crossbone Gundam X-1. And another Gundam, with a familiar face sitting in the cockpit. It's Zabine. That's the eyepatch guy from F91, in case the large lancer on his mobile suit wasn't a dead giveaway. Before the sortie, Bera reminds him of the general try not to kill rule, and the one-eyed soldier says that he'll try, after which he flies out of the ship. Tobia Aranax is watching the whole scene from the bridge, admiring the mobile suits and the ship's captain somewhat hints at who might be one of their sponsors. Suddenly, Bera's cheery demeanor vanishes. She stands up and orders the whole ship to bombard the meteor base into oblivion. We've somewhat seen this side of her in the tail end of the F-91 movie, but it might catch some people off guard. Yes, she may be a kind person that despises killing, but at the same time, she's more than willing to pull the trigger if the situation demands it. This sudden change shocks Tobia, and since he isn't seeing any counterattack yet, he assumes that they just shot some civilian settlement. Bera just tells him to shut up. See, this is why she's the best girl of the series. A somewhat belated missile response confirms that she made the right call. The standard missile barrage followed closely by a bunch of Jovian mobile suits giving chase. Kincaid's unit dives into their ranks, 
managing to heavily damage an enemy grunt using a knife stored in its foot. To say that the Crossbone Gundams are well equipped for fighting up close would be an understatement. Still keeping a serious face, Vera explains to Tobia that for years Jupiter Empire has been hiding under a front of a humble colony cluster to avoid suspicion, waiting for a chance to strike and even supporting Warhawks in the Earth Sphere while building a formidable military force. That being said, the Empire couldn't risk a prolonged war campaign, meaning that if they were to strike, they would have to put all their strength behind a single hit. That's also why Professor Karras was so eager to kill all the witnesses who saw his scheme. Now that the Crossbone Vanguard knows about the base, they're on the hit list too. And the Jupiter forces immediately emphasize this point by lobbing a fucking nuke at their ship. However, Kincaid comes in just in time to assemble his rifle load a grenade and fire. The warhead detonates, drowning the surrounding space in blinding light and vaporizing most of the Jovian survivors that didn't bail out of their mobile suits in time. I don't think that this has to be said, but the Jupiter Empire will do whatever it takes to fulfill their goals. Losses be damned in the service of one man. Crux Dogati. Speaking of the Jupiter's ruler, the man is acting rather aloof about the attack on the asteroid base. His underling is somewhat concerned, but President Dogati mentions something about new weapons and how the Empire's possible counterattack could be just the right time to test them out. Standing inside a large water tank, he also starts to cackle at the thought. At roughly the same time, the recently enlisted pirate kid, Tobia Aranax, is having a lot of trouble adjusting to his new job, especially the piloting. Given that the captured Batala he is training on has all its thrusters in the legs, it is fairly obvious that this gimmick would be a challenge to a lot of novice pilots. It is revealed that about a month had passed since he joined the Crossbone Vanguard's Space Pirates. He's gradually getting used to the routine, and from the looks of it, Bernadette is holding up pretty well too. During downtime, Kincaid catches him up to speed on the pirates' technology, such as the anti-beam mantles. The kid may be skipping out on school, but that doesn't mean his education will be neglected. There's a call from the bridge. It looks like they received a distress signal of sorts. And the source appears to be a cargo ship in the Jupiter's orbit. Kincaid suggests that it could be a trap. Still, the ship's captain orders mobile suits to sortie, leaving Zabine's unit, the Crossbone Gundam X2, as well as a few Zondo gays in the hangar as a backup just in case. On the way to the hangar, Tobia asks Kincaid about the X-2's pilot, and we learn that the two were rival ace pilots in a previous war, roughly 10 years ago, and even now that they fight for the same side, he has a hunch that Zabine still maintains some animosity towards him. Another thing to note is that this is also Tobia's first official sortie with the pirate kid being fairly blatant about his excitement, even saying that he wants to become a pilot worthy of a Gundam, to which Kincaid asks whether he wants to try. Back in the hangar, Zabine is sitting in the cockpit of his X-2, plotting something. With Kincaid out of the ship, that just leaves him, Bera, maybe some of the Zondo gay pilots, this seems like a good opportunity for... He suddenly spots a familiar figure walking by, holding an apple. It's Kincaid. Confused by this, Zabine puts two and two together. If Kincaid stayed behind, then the pilot in the X-1's cockpit must be... Tobia. 
The kid is having some difficulty adjusting and some of his fellow pilots are getting a little worried. But they ultimately shrug it off, since Kincaid must have had his reasons for assigning him there. Zabine asks about the obvious, to which Kincaid responds that he doesn't really trust the one-eyed soldier enough to leave him unsupervised. Doblondi insists that he defected from the Cosmo Babylonia movement because he despised discount Darth Vader's cruel methods, but Kincaid isn't really buying it. A man like Zabine is the type that would care more about specific principles, so it's more likely that Blondie here has some ulterior motives. In the meantime, Tobia reaches the cargo ship, but by the time he closes in, one of the Zondo gay pilots tells him to fall back immediately. It was a good call, since a bunch of new Jovian mobile suits suddenly come flying out of the ship. These are anti-ship models, and they are headed for Mother Vanguard, the flagship of the pirates. Tobia and the others try to get back to the ship, but they are stopped by a barrage of beams coming from the side. The Jupiter forces brought in a mobile armor. Appropriately named, the Cangrejo is a giant crab-like machine that is armed to the teeth with various beam weapons and quickly advancing towards their location. The anti-ship teams have reached the ship, slicing into its hull. But before they could do any substantial damage, the ship turns on its beam shield, destroying some of the assailants. There's still some mopping up to be done, not to mention that Tobia could use a hand with the mobile armor, which prompts both Zabine and Kincaid to launch in the X2 and the Core Fighter respectively. The former is going after the mobile suit that is attacking a cannon on the ship's bow. At first, he draws his Zambas rifle at the enemy. But then he reconsiders, opting for a melee approach instead. However, the enemy machine parries his strike, using a giant blade in the front. It's a beam axe, tailor-made for attacking ships. Once Zabine realizes this, he pulls back and approaches from the side, impaling the enemy mobile suit with X2's lancer and I'm pretty sure the pilot of it was turned into mincemeat as well. With the whole ship at stake, he can't really afford the luxury of mercy. Meanwhile, Tobia closes in on the mobile armor. As Kincaid taught him, with the invention of beam shields and similar technology, it is often well advised to engage up close to ensure that a hit would connect. In fact, the crossbone Gundams are more than suited for that purpose. Thing is, the crab-like mobile armor is still a crab-like mobile armor, and before the pirate kid lands a hit, the crossbone X1 gets caught in Cangrejo's claws. Just as things are starting to look bleak for Tobia, Kincaid finally arrives, telling him to eject. The nice thing about core fighters is that they double as removable cockpit blocks, allowing Kincaid to hop into the crossbone X1 and beat the shit out of the giant enemy crab, even striking its weak spot for massive damage. He dodges Cangrejo's final barrage and comes in for the finisher, ripping a hole in the mobile armor and yanking the pilot out before destroying it. With their ace in the hole being reduced to smithereens, the Jupiter forces retreat, for now. It is now apparent that if the Crossbone Vanguard is to do any substantial damage to the Jupiter Empire, they can't just attack bases one by one, and the full frontal attack is also out of the question, given their current resources. Probably the best plan of action would be a surgical strike that will cripple the Empire. Their next mission is to locate the whereabouts of the Jupiter Empire, its ruler, and destroy them both. This silent war has entered a new stage. Also, Tobia basically becomes the fall guy for the recent hijinks with the X1 and gets toilet duty for a week. In this first part, I more or less covered the introduction to the series and the first three chapters, which precede the first major arc of the Crossbone Gundam manga. 
we got to meet most of the cast and even got a sneak peek at the military capabilities of both the Crossbone Vanguard and the Jupiter Empire. Moreover, the story had teased us with a bit of a sneak peek of things to come, be it the dynamics within Mother Vanguard's crew or Crux Dogerty's plans. On top of that, our protagonist is thrown in the middle of all this mess, traveling on a ship whose crew is mostly composed of people who have fought in the previous conflicts, which could be a bit of a callback to the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Suffice to say, there is a lot to look forward to in the next arc of the story, which I'll cover in part 2. The script for the first part alone took me multiple weeks and was around 11 pages long, and given how big is the scope of the next arc, I have no clue how long will it take me to finish the next one. Anyways, until next time, Shirtlade signing out. Before the invasion begins, we've got some trash to take care of. Is it really necessary? My, my. Is something the matter? <sighs> Damn! You won't get away with it, Karas! Tobia, my boy. In this world, only the strong survives and conquers. Atone for your sins, Kincaid! Zabini! Alright, it's time for part two. In the cold vacuum of space, under the brightly shining flag, there is a ship carrying two Gundams, a bunch of veterans and a 15-year-old kid. Last time, we left off where the Mother Vanguard's crew opted for a desperate and risky plan to defeat the Jupiter Empire. With the blue planet at stake, and considering the intensity of their skirmishes thus far, it is now apparent that time is of the essence. In the first part, I covered the first three chapters of Volume 1, and this one will be covering the plot from Chapter 4 all the way to Volume 5's second chapter. Suffice to say, this is going to be a long one, so without further ado, let's get to it. Admittedly, it's been a while, so let me catch you up to speed on what has happened thus far. After the events of the movie Mobile Suit Gundam F91, set in UC-0123, Seabook, Cecily and Zabine took control of the Crossbone Vanguard and became space pirates. They began attacking a faction known as Jupiter Empire, which is under the firm grasp of a dictator called Crux Dogati. An engineering student by the name of Tobia Ernax joins the pirates alongside Bernadette Briette, a little girl with blonde hair who is on the run from the Empire. Having fought the Jovian forces multiple times, Cecily, now under her Rona family birth name, chooses to carry out a pinpoint strike in order to topple the head of the Empire. In the Jupiter's orbit, one of the oxygen gathering stations picks up a distress call. Oddly enough, it's Tobia. He's being pursued by Crossbone Vanguard's mobile suits and appears to have a wounded passenger in the cockpit. Suddenly, the X-2 pulls out a large beam cannon. This is of course a part of the plan. In the meantime, the Jupiter forces begin to sortie, with a custom-colored red battalion within their ranks. Its pilot is a bearded Jovian, who commands the squad to proceed in a high-mobility formation. This maneuver, by the way, has the Batalas retract their legs and enter a sort of a cruising mode, trading fuel efficiency for sheer speed. Having sighted the enemy, Zabine moves on to the plan's next phase, firing upon Tobias Zondo Gay and heavily damaging it. 
The one-eyed soldier smirks at the results of his work, which distract him from a red mobile suit coming from the side. The large booster tank attached to the Crossbone Gundam X2 erupts into a fiery blaze. The Black Gundam emerges from the cloud of smoke, encountering the Red Batala and having to parry a swift kick from the assailant. Both mobile suits open fire, with the others not staying too far behind. An old man, sitting in the X1's cockpit, flies in to assist Blondie, and after they interrupt Zavine's fight with the Red Batala, both agree to retreat back into the ship. The Jovian forces like the cruising speed to chase them, which the bearded Jovian acknowledges with a frustrated sigh. The only thing left from the encounter is the heavily damaged Zondo Gay, which the Jupiter's forces bring onto the ship. The nature of that mission, which Para and King Kate brought up earlier, is now made completely clear. Tobia and one of the space pirates are to infiltrate this facility and gather information. Kincaid is playing the part of the wounded escapee and he's doing a fairly decent job at it, since the Jovians stationed there have fallen for the cover story hook, line and sinker. While the head of the base is quite eager to know more, the bearded Jovian from earlier takes the no-nonsense approach, taking Tobia and Kincaid towards the station's hospital. He also mentions that Tobia reminds him of his son, who perished during a work accident. Upon noticing the look on the pirate kid's face, he gives Toby a reassuring smile, introducing himself as Barnes Gernsback and escorting the duo to the elevator. As Kincaid and Toby are continuing through the facility, Kincaid gets up from the stretcher he's been placed on, knocking out the guard. They got in. We go back a little bit, with the captain of the Mother Vanguard giving an announcement to a couple of Jovian prisoners of war. Long story short, she plans to release them. Into space, that is. Now, if you're assuming that getting stranded in space is an especially fucked up way to die, you'd be correct. I mean, if you've seen Victory Gundam, you're more than familiar with what a fate like that could do to a person's psyche. However, for Griffin losing her marbles aside, Bera does order the space pirates to drop the POWs off near the usual Jupiter patrol routes. Which is slightly less cruel, but I'll elaborate on this a little bit later. While Tobia is a little surprised about the extent to which she goes to avoid killing, he also comes up with an idea to use these drop-offs as an opportunity for infiltrating the Empire. However, given both Barrow's reply and her expression while doing so, he quickly learns that such a thing was tried, and the results were not ideal to say the least. The pirate kid goes to see Kincaid, noticing that something happens to his hand. As it turns out, Kincaid has changed his own fingerprints and added an identification number onto his hand, muttering something about the Jovian security being somewhat strict. He's acting very casual, as opposed to Tobias' more concerned look, and we promptly see the reason for the latter. There's a corpse lying on the table, dressed in a standard Jupiter Empire spacesuit. And as Kincaid clarifies, the deceased pilot is the original owner of the identification number. After all, this is still a war, so the numbers of casualties will never be zero. As the two leave for their mission, the rest of the crew stops by to see them off. The image of the dead Jovian hasn't left Tobias' mind, and the pirate kid starts to think about the contradiction of his new profession. They're fighting a war, during which they have to kill at some point, yet they let their opponents slip. Not to mention, regardless of how righteous their goals are, they are still pirates, and they still rob resources. Are the efforts to keep the casualties low just a shallow excuse to give them some kind of a moral high ground? Almost as if he read his fault. Sabine Sharo chimes in, saying that his suspicions are justified. As we've seen earlier, the one-eyed soldier has more straightforward views on waging a war, seeing mercy as nothing more than a hindrance, and wanting to end conflicts as fast as possible, without any remorse or hesitation. Briefly taken back by this, Tobia walks off, meeting Bernadette on the way. She is very concerned for the pirate kid, knowing full well what the mission entails. Kincaid tries to reassure her that Tobia will do his best and the elderly Zondo gay pilot that warned Tobia during the ambush attack from earlier 
says that the kid has the qualities of a new type. Given how shamelessly did the old man spell something that will become more important later on, I have no choice but to explain what a new type is. Don't worry, I'll be brief. Just wanted to catch up the people not playing the home game when it comes to Gundam stuff. So, a new type is a human being that has gained some sort of a sixth sense which can help them in combat and gives them better spatial awareness on top of limited telepathic abilities. That's what a new type is in the broadest strokes possible. Anyways, the old man also claims that he is a new type as well, boasting that he took down six MS-09 doms in a single ball. And Stobia is unsure whether he should be impressed or whether the old man is embellishing some of his claims. Nonetheless, before he interjects, the old man tries to be a little dramatic and says that one has to endure about two or three near-death experiences before awakening as a new type. Bernadette hands Toby a small trinket as a good luck charm, and the pirate kid finally gets to leave. Additionally, Zabine reassures the now disguised Kincaid about the fact that regardless of their disagreements, the blondie can at the very least be trusted with keeping the ship and the bearer safe. Going back to the two infiltrators, both change into Jovian uniforms. Continuing onward, with the now unconscious guard taking Kincaid's place on the stretcher. Continuing down the hall, Toby is reminded of Barra's instructions for their infiltration mission. Aside from the summaries of what we already know, the pirate kid also recalls Barra saying something about how the Jupiter Empire goes out of its way to destroy any and all data, should it be at risk of falling into enemy hands, further reinforcing the notion that sneaking in and stealing the data out of Jupiter's database directly is the best course of action. As the two pirates walk through the hallway, Tobia sees a woman begging a taller Jupiter citizen for water, which momentarily distracts him. Just like the boy has heard earlier, the water is much more scarce on Jupiter, which means that most Jovians get it in smaller rations. The woman's husband is sickly and in need of some water, but the tall Jovian's hands are tied. This leads to Tobia briefly breaking character and handing one of the water containers under the stretcher to the woman's daughter, which doesn't go over too well. To prevent the boy from unwittingly dooming them both, Kincaid shuts him up with a right hook and a barrage of reprimands, which successfully distract the onlookers and lets the girl sneak off with the water ration for her father. He then apologizes for the disturbance, helping Tobia up and continuing down the hallway. They suddenly encounter a short-haired man in a mask, but continue onwards, dismissing him as one of the patients. After making it to the station's residential area, they drop off the guard from earlier and make their way to... Tobia falls down, sinking into the urban abyss, surrounded by hexagonal structures of the city's landscape. Well, fall would be a strong word. The gravity here is too weak for it to be called a fall. After bouncing back up, Tobias fear turns into confusion. Unlike on Earth and its colonies, where one has a sense of up and down, the Empire's residential blocks are built to use free space with maximum efficiency. However, the two can't ponder about Jovian architecture too much, since a loud alarm noise rips through the residential block's ambient chatter. On top of that, there's two Jovian patrol machines heading towards the pirate duo. They have been discovered. The scene continues in the second volume, where we get to see the shot from another angle. Kincaid barely manages to tell Tobia to flee before his yell is interrupted by gunshots as their mechanical pursuers open fire, with blatant disregard for collateral damage. The pirate kid is momentarily shocked by how indiscriminately do the Jupiter Empire's forces fire upon them, forcing Kincaid to shove him out of harm's way, making a hasty escape. The two manage to find a crevice between the Jovian structures, fleeing from the grasp of the patrol machines. They still briefly fire a few bursts their way, which the two pirates barely dodge. Thanks to how dense the buildings in the residential block's intersection are, they should be mostly safe. For now. During the brief downtime, they blend into the crowd of civilians, who are watching an announcement on a large screen. It's about the Jovian prisoners that Vera released earlier. Suffice to say, they made it home safe, just to be publicly executed. 
Tobias reaction is very appropriate to the situation. As per the Jupiter Empire's military regulations, leaving one's machine behind on the field is a punishable offense, and since Jovian top brass are absolute assholes, the officer on screen orders the execution. The onlookers are powerless to do anything but watch, as the firing squad draws their weapons and takes aim. The pirate kid tries to flee from the grim image on the screen, but in his hurry he almost runs into the patrol machine that was searching for him, with Kincaid pulling him back to safety. Thankfully, the Jupiter Empire's forces haven't found the two yet, with the base's commander becoming visibly frustrated. However, he spots a familiar face walking in from the right. It's the masked patient we've seen earlier. The commander is impressed by the man's resolve to walk all the way there and even more so by the masked man's claim that he might know where the base's infiltrators are headed with the commander offering to provide him with any additional resources he needs. The masked man declines, saying that there's no need for that and heading off. As he is leaving, he also overhears Barnes Gurns back, getting an earful from the base commander. Based on the man's hunch, the Jupiter forces get deployed into the base's residential block, continuing towards the likely location of the pirates. Speaking of the duo, in the meantime, King is working on extracting the information they came for, while Tobia is idly sulking right next to him. It appears that seeing the execution from earlier got to him, and it got to him hard. The boy once again questions the purpose of letting the prisoners of war go, if they get picked up and executed regardless. While King Kate tries to interject that at the very least it puts the blood on the Empire's hands, Tobia isn't really buying it asking whether Kincaid knew of the prisoner's fate beforehand. The X-1's pilot doesn't even bother to lie to him, answering that he had guessed that something of that sort would likely happen. This completely sets off Tobia, who angrily questions him on why does Kincaid still spare most of his foes if they are going to die either way. Kincaid has had enough as well, jumping into a fairly revealing rant. Turns out Barry is still holding on to the hope that despite being in a war, she can avoid or at least somewhat reduce the amount of bloodshed. While Kincaid is well aware of the realities of war, hell, he even fought in one before, he tries his best not to tell Bera about things like the Empire's habit of executing their own people. The reason Bera defected from the original Crossbone Vanguard back when it was under the rule of the Rona family was likely due to her upbringing as one of the Frontier Force citizens and a stepdaughter of a baker. Things would have probably been a little different if she would be raised in the Rona house. As such, she's the type that mostly thinks about a small handful of people, while sometimes missing the forest for the trees. Bera had fought the Cosmo aristocracy movement and once that conflict ended, she was truly happy. When she and Kincaid became aware of the Jupiter Empire, Bera had the option to pretend that it didn't exist. After all, it was just another distant place and surely the two could just leave the resolution of any upcoming conflicts to the Earth Federation. In fact, she had the option to do so, with little to no repercussions at that point. However, Barrow chose to assemble a fighting force to fight against Crux Dogatis forces, resurrecting the Crossbone Vanguard name. In that very moment, Kincaid has decided that no matter how selfish, sanctimonious or hypocritical his actions might be, no matter how immoral his actions may become, he will do everything in his power to protect Bera from both harm and from the war turning her into a monster. This makes Tobia go quiet and the pirate boy proceeds to get to work on the keyboard. He says that while he doesn't fully understand, in this very moment the chatter is just slowing the whole process of data theft down and with the two of them working on it, the process is completed rather swiftly. The terminal beeps once spitting out a floppy disk. After all, this is a manga that ran from December 1994 to 1997, with the series being gradually compiled into volumes in 1995, so such additions are more than understandable. Anyways, with the floppy disk acquired, the two make a run for it. They evade the guards, navigating the corridors and even managing to hop onto what appears to be the Jupiter base's train. Suddenly, a long steel wire goes flying towards them. They've got company. The company in question being the masked man they've seen earlier in the infirmary, with the steel wire in question 
catching Tobia and pulling the pirate kid towards him. The masked man apparently happens to recognize the boy. Of course, Kincaid wastes no time and makes it clear he's having none of it, by throwing a knife he was hiding in his boot and hitting their pursuer straight between the eyes. To his surprise, the mask was thick enough to stop the knife, breaking apart shortly afterwards and revealing the identity of their enemy. It's Professor Karras. Now without the hospital gown and the mask, he taunts the two pirates and reveals that he survived his detour into space thanks to his wire-like weapon. It's a garrote wire. A simple yet effective weapon that has been used by executioners and spy alike for more than 2000 years. While obviously being slightly improved when compared to its real-world counterparts, its simple design and its brutal effectiveness has been maintained. The professor tries doing his usual intimidation spiel, but Tobia headbutts him, loosening the professor's grip and opening an opportunity for Kincaid to throw another knife. This throw, however, does get intercepted by Professor Karras, though with some quick thinking, Kincaid does manage to close the distance and tackle the professor, suffering only a shallow cut across his left cheek while doing so. While he does manage to land a fairly hefty punch, the professor isn't too shabby in the fisticuffs department either, and hits Kincaid back with a knee to the gut, subsequently placing the Gundam pilot in a stranglehold. In the meantime, Tobia manages to unwrap the wire that he was trapped in, and while his attempts to save Kincaid from the professor's grasp didn't have much success, he does manage to distract Karras using the trinket from Bernadette. The now baffled professor manages to barely notice a leaping silhouette of Kincaid. But it's too late. The Gundam pilot lands a kick, which launches Karras away, with the despicable adversary in question throwing a grenade their way as a parting present. Thanks to the rather questionable artificial gravity within the base, the pirate duo manages to bail out from the train. We also see that the Jovian professor made it out alive, and as Kincaid proceeds to tell Tobia, the guy is the Empire's special agent, making him a very tough enemy. However, what surprises Tobia is a voice coming from behind. It's the little girl they gave the water ration earlier. She leads them to a diner, where they meet her mother as well as the venue's owner. The two pirates get a brief moment of respite and start talking to the three Jovians in the diner. Aside from finding out that the woman's husband is doing a little better, Kincaid and Tobia find out that the main route to the mobile suit hangar had been fortified. Luckily for them, however, their new allies have an alternate route to the hangar for them, on top of spare spacesuits. Bidding their farewell, the duo departs through the maintenance tunnel towards the hangar. Back on the Crossbone Vanguard's mothership, Barra is growing worried about Kincaid and Tobia. About seven hours had passed since she last saw either of the two. On top of that, it is quite a dangerous mission. The wait is almost unbearable. Suddenly, there's a glaring blip flashing on the screen. Apparently, there was an explosion at the Empire's base. This makes Bera spring from her seat, ordering the Zondo gay pilots and Zabine to Sori in order to retrieve the pirate kid and the pilot of the Crossbone Gundam X-1. Speaking of the two, both Tobia and Kincaid snagged themselves a Batala and beelined out of the base's hangar. However, an incoming red flash reminds them that they aren't out of the woods yet. It's Barnes Gurns back in his custom unit. The bearded lieutenant draws a beam saber and prepares for battle. The two pirates draw their beam saber as well, closing in and trying to land a hit on the red machine. Tobia is having some difficulties fighting Barnes, since the kid is up against an experienced pilot. Kincaid tries to give the pirate kid some breathing room by charging in, but since he is not familiar with the machine he is piloting, it has mixed results. Tobia tries to go for the hippie option, discarding his machine gun and flying towards Barnes, but this only infuriates the soldier. Barnes proceeds to continue attacking Tobia's Batala. The pirate kid is taken aback by this, and before he manages to do anything, his machine loses an arm. During the fight, the bearded lieutenant also reveals the reason behind his indignation. In the Jupiter Sphere, a lot of vital resources are incredibly scarce, which means that for the most part, your average Jovian couldn't give less of a fuck about who's in charge 
as long as there's oxygen and water keeps getting produced. It is these conditions that make Tobias' pleas ring hollow to Lieutenant Gernsback. As they fight, more battalions come flying in as reinforcements, trying to surround the two escapees. Despite their best efforts, Kincaid and Tobia are outgunned, and while they do try to keep up with the Empire's forces, their machines have sustained a lot of damage over the span of the fight. The enemy's batalas close in for the final strike, but something stops them in their tracks. It's the X2, which proceeds to impale two of the Jovian machines, make a hole in another, and before the rest of the Jupiter's pursuit force reacts to what just happened, the rest of the Crossbone Vanguard's pilots arrive. An old man piloting the Crossbone Gundam X1 hands Kincaid a beam's amber. That's the beam cutlass, in case the page didn't make it apparent. With some help from the X1 and the Zondo Gaze, the enemy force is destroyed, and the two Crossbone Gundam pilots manage to incapacitate Barnes's Batala. The mission was a success. As the pirate kid heads back to the ship, he watches as the remnants of the Jupiter forces pull the heavily damaged Red Batala back to their base, aboard the Mother Vanguard. Everybody is rejoicing about Kincaid and Tobia's return. The pirate kid reunites with Bernadette, and since he sees where Kincaid is headed, he suggests that they go elsewhere. During this downtime, another ship of the Crossbone Vanguard arrives. It's the Little Grey, commanded by Captain Onmo, a red-haired woman with a very happy-go-lucky attitude. The ship comes bearing much-needed supplies, on top of mail sent from Earth. Obviously, the crew is really happy about this, sprinting towards the cargo bay. Once they get her around, Barrerona also informs the crew about the outcome of Tobia and Kincaid's exploits, especially about the information on the floppy disk. The location of President Crux Dogerty has been pinpointed to the Jupiter's moon Io, likely in the proximity of a Jovian mining base. According to the data, it's the most probable location of the Empire's center of operations as well, but some of the crew members seem to be quite doubtful of such a possibility. Either way, if the Crossbone Vanguard were to strike now, it would cause some serious damage, which is a conclusion that Bera ultimately comes to as she rallies the rest of the crew. The excitement is palpable, as the Vanguard starts preparing for a battle. As the space pirates rush to their stations, Bera sneaks off and heads for the ship's kitchen. Given that there is some downtime before the mission, she has decided to tend to one of her pastimes from her bakery days. In the meantime, Kincaid is fairly busy with preparations in the hangar. The supplies from Captain Onmo did come in handy, especially as far as ammunition is concerned. However, when Kincaid gets to the part of the list covering mobile suit replacements, he stops with a surprised look on his face. As it turns out, even spare parts for the Zondo Gaze have become much harder to get as of late, especially given that the XM-08 has been around for over a decade. Even so, the captain of the Little Grey has been able to get a handful of them, on top of some standardized components. Although this does easily cover repairs, the Space Pirates are left with five mobile suits at most, not counting the two Gundams. As Kincaid promptly states, this is going to be troublesome. Nonetheless, they still have a few captured Jovian mobile suits that they could use, which, while not ideal, could somewhat mitigate the problem. On the other side of the ship, Tobia Ernax has finally gotten some proper rest in a while, with Bernadette bringing him some tea once he got up. The two briefly chat, then the pirate kid remembers about the pendant she gave him earlier and returns it, stating that the lucky charm earned its keep, and even saved his bacon at some point. She simply smiles. The small crystal pendant was a keepsake from Bernadette's mother, who used to live on Earth. She used to tell Bernadette stories about the Blue Planet, and even now, the girl still yearns to visit the Earth and stand on its soil with her own two feet. Tobia assures her that such a dream is definitely possible, though suddenly his expression changes to one of slight concern. He briefly thinks back to his recent run-ins with Professor Karras and the Jupiter forces, but once Bernadette asks what's the matter, he quickly brushes her off. His stream of thoughts is momentarily interrupted by Kincaid, who came to check on him and to get the kid something to eat in the meantime. He tries to strike up a conversation about the supply ship outside, but the topic quickly turns to the bread lying on the tray. It's from the batch Vera made, 
which Kincaid casually mentions, catching Toby off guard. The pirate kid admits that he might have gotten the wrong impression of her, to which Kincaid tells him that he is being too hard on himself. After a moment, Toby asks about whether Kincaid and Bera are lovers, which in turn briefly puts the Gundam pilot on the back foot. Back on the bridge, the captain of the Mother Vanguard insists that given the nature of the upcoming mission, Tobia and Bernadette should sit this one out, preferably on the board of the supply ship, especially with that supply ship heading towards Earth. Tobia objects, since he has already been involved in active combat. At the same time, this mission is going to be far more difficult than what he had faced before, which is what Barra retorts with, further adding that his parents would probably be worried. After some convincing, however, the pirate kid gets to stay. As for Bernadette, she is definitely going, and so Tobia goes to see her off. Looking through a window next to the pair, one couldn't help but notice a spherical silhouette. In the distance is Eo, the moon that will soon get lit ablaze by the upcoming battle. Much further away, on board of the Little Grey, Captain Onmo goes to check on their blonde-haired guest. She is not in her room, not even under the bed. Bernadette simply can't be found anywhere. Well, at least not on Onmo's ship. As the next page shows us, old habits die hard, especially Bernadette's stowaway routine. The crew on deck is on their battle station, anticipating the skirmish, closing in on the cold dead moon that will quickly become their battlefield. Mother Vanguard folds down its mast, entering Eos atmosphere like an oversized throwing dart. The ship is quickly closing in on its target destination, the moon's surface. In the hangar, Crossbone Vanguard pilots are awaiting the touchdown, ready to sortie. Tobia is there as well, sitting inside the cockpit of one of the captured Jovian mobile suits. The kid thinks back at what Lieutenant Barnes told him, but this time the memory only strengthens his resolve to fight. Just like the Jovian soldier, Tobia had lost people who are close to him. His parents died in a colony construction related accident. However, this loss did not weigh him down. In fact, it is what ultimately drove Tobia to continue his parents' legacy of pioneering and hope. With the ship closing in on the enemy base, Bera orders a missile barrage. The Jupiter Empire responds in kind, with the volley's impact rocking Mother Vanguard's hull. Jovian forces seem to be in a tight formation in a close proximity to one of Eo's many craters. The formation appears to be eight ships strong, forming a circular defensive pattern. Seemingly outgunned, the Crossbone Vanguard forces prepare the sortie. They're up against multiple Batala mobile suits, Cangrejo type mobile armors and even the high performance EMS-07 Erebado mobile suits. The Zondo gaze of the Space Pirates launch, though the main ship appears to be going elsewhere. In the meantime, the XMO-8 formation starts to clash with the Jupiter Force, already sustaining some losses. There is a Jovian patrol in the distance, observing the scene. Suddenly, a familiar white silhouette breaks the deafening silence. It's the Crossbone X-1, which wastes no time and punches the lights out on one of the Batalas. His squadmates follow suit, using the confusion of the Jupiter forces to wipe out the rest of the patrol with the old Zondo gay pilot even landing a hefty punch on an enemy grunt. Continuing onward, the pilot looks up and bids his old machine farewell. The now discontinued Zondo gay has been his friend for many past battles. From the X-1's cockpit, Kincaid decides to do a quick roll call. Zabine is right next to him, in the X-2. Old man Umon, the former Zondo gay pilot from earlier, is in one piece, and so are Yona, Harita and Jared. In the back of the formation is a custom colored Pez Batala, belonging to the pirate kid himself, Tobia Ernax. This operation is quite the gamble, considering enemy numbers, with Zabine estimating the odds to be 40 to 1. However, the Crossbone Vanguard's diversion via the Zondo Gaze might be the winning edge for them. The stakes are high. Suddenly, a set of silhouettes appear on the edges of the Lunar Canyon. It's the Jupiter's ground combat units, the EMS-09 Wagon, 
And here you thought you won't see the wheels on mobile suits for another 20 years. One of these mobile suits charges Kincaid's X1, but the Gundam dispatches the enemy machine with ease, using the beam zamber. Another squad of these mobile suits does use their numbers advantage to target the other crossbone pilots. Thanks to their wheels, the wagon units close the gap with a significant speed, catching a few of the Vanguard's batalas off guard. After all, these zooming bastards have been optimized, which, as Uman proceeds to correctly point out, might have been for the future Jovian invasion of Earth. One wagon proceeds to take out the owner's unit, but fortunately, the pilot in question manages to bail out of the cockpit just in time. Old man Umon tries to retaliate, but another attack comes his way, making his machine lose a hand. This finally sets off Tobias' fight or flight response, and the pirate kid grabs the nearest boulder and chucks it into nearby enemy machine, destroying it at the same time. The Jovian forces try to swarm Kincaid's X1, surrounding it with a free machine formation. The Gundam pilot, however, isn't having none of it, reaches for his beam cutlass and throws it, nailing one of them in the head. With the weapon in flight, he also launches one of the hip-mounted anchors of the X-1, attaching it to the improvised projectile. With one quick jerking motion, the blade is set into motion again, ripping the trio of attackers apart. Zabine's X-2 is being kept busy as well with the one-eyed blondie responding with a battle tactic affectionately known as shish kebab. With more and more enemies piling in, Kincaid opts to lead his pilots towards a cave-like formation, and seemingly this works, with their Jovian pursuers keeping up with the pace. Continuing deeper into the cave, the space pirates stumble upon a lake of lava in their way, but a large silhouette in the middle of it makes it clear that they've got bigger problems to worry about. A giant mobile armor emerges from the scorching hot pool of lava. It even has a fitting name to go with it. The EMA-04 Elefante. The wacky yet menacing machine gets ready to attack, extending a long, tentacle-shaped arm and firing a set of beam cannons. The beam shots are strong enough to make pieces of rubble and other debris fly violently from the point of impact, forcing both Tobia and Kincaid to evade. To add insult to injury, the beam cannons start moving. All five of these cannons fly out of the machine towards the space pirates, unleashing more shots. The Gundam pilot comes to a very quick conclusion. This one is going to be a handful. Tobia and the former Zondo gay pilots are momentarily overwhelmed by the multi-angle attacks from the mobile armor, but can still keep up, albeit barely. The same, however, cannot be said about the enemy ground force troops that have arrived in the meantime, just in time, to receive an extra large helping of the good old friendly fire. The mobile armor's pilot gets a little frustrated about fellow Jibra Empire troops getting in the way, but shrugs it off, almost becoming gleeful at the occurrence. Even with superior mobility and a cloak that mitigates beam shots, the X-1 is having trouble with the flying beam cannons as well, but after regrouping with Umo, Kincaid comes up with a plan. If the main unit is distracted, it would be possible to pick off the remote-controlled beam cannons one by one. However, there is one minor problem. The sucker has an eye field, deflecting the beam shots, aimed at the main body of the mobile arm. Harita, one of the former Zondo gay pilots, tries to close in with his batal, but the giant arm of the Elefante catches his unit, slowly crushing it within a firm squeeze. Zabine tries to bail the guy out by charging the mobile armor, but the arm twists around in his direction and blows off the X2's leg. The Elefante being a handful is now a fairly gross understatement. It also finishes off the captured pilot, prompting old man Umon to run in, fully intending to repay the favor. He brushes past Kincaid, who is starting to have serious problems with the beam cannons. But Tobia? who's nearby, notices something. The cannons move in a specific pattern, allowing him to capitalize on this knowledge as he shoots and damages a few of them. However, these cannons are big enough to not go down in a single shot, which prompts him to opt for an even more reckless approach. The pirate kid ditches the beam rifle and dashes towards the mobile armor. His Pez Batawa is a machine tailor-made for attacking ships. 
meaning that he should do just fine against the Mogul armor. He dodges the first cannon module, jumps on the second one, using it as a springboard, and rams into the Mogul armor, lighting the Pez Batala's beam axe ablaze. The shining green blade grows deep into the Mogul armor, causing heavy damage, but the tentacle arm is still moving, towards Tobias' general direction to be precise. Though this time around, Kincaid manages to leap in, severing the mechanical appendage for good. Umon, Jared and Zabine open fire at the mobile armor's lower half, taking out the majority of its propulsion systems. The Elefante comes crashing down, and suddenly Kincaid gets an idea. His X-1 steps two beam spikes into the mobile armor, allowing its pilot to drag the enemy machine. With one of the enemy ships in sight, the Gundam pilot lights up the thrusters and hurls the Elefante towards it, grabbing Tobias' machine and leaping off of the smoking piece of debris, which rapidly impacts with the ship. The enemy defensive line has been breached, and as such, the Mother Vanguard is cleared to approach the base. Come to think of it, approach is not the right word for it. Ram into the base fits much better. The captain and the crew of the Crossbone Vanguard flagship brace for impact as their trusty space galleon reaches the wall of the base. To clear out the enemy defenses, the ship's deputy captain orders to open fire, reducing a large chunk of the surrounding area into debris. Unfortunately, some of the debris chunks do scratch up the ship's mast pretty bad, so while the breach was successful, any getaways will be hindered for the time being. The engines stop, and Bera stands up to compose herself. They are finally there. Kinkade and Tobia watch the explosion from the distance. Since their flagship has arrived, it is time for the next stage of the plan. Meanwhile on Mother Vanguard, the crew is getting ready to touch down and in all the ruckus they barely notice a small blonde stowaway steal a moon rover. Well, they do, but not fast enough. Having reached the base as well, the Crossbone Gundam X-1 makes short work of its defensive force taking down even the high-end Arabado units with relative ease. Zabine does so as well, albeit with much more enthusiasm. Not necessarily due to the fact that there's nobody to get on his case for killing, but because the possible end of the Jupiter Empire could serve as a stepping stone to his ideals of cosmo-aristocracy. Yes, yes, finally! His excitement holds to a stop once he remembers that the pilot of the X-1 is still around. The old man Umon is there as well, and he's got a bad feeling about this mission. In the inner halls on his throne, President Crux Togati suddenly bursts into laughter. Since this ends the volume, we are treated to a brief summary before being thrust back into the action. As the Crossbone Vanguard reached the base, there was also someone else paying a visit to Dogati's dwelling. This visitor, however, is clad in a spacesuit and holds a small crystal pendant in his right hand. The Jupiter forces gathered in the President Dogati's hall are anxiously pointing their weapons at the door. Unfortunately for them, the Crossbone Gundam X-1 just punches the wall apart, entering the room and raining chunks of it on its unlucky defenders. The Jovian force tries to recover and one of the troops aims a rocket launcher at the Gundam. But these efforts are quickly shut down by Yona and Jared. With the infantry in the room getting successfully suppressed, Kincaid jumps out of the X-1. Pointing a rifle at the Jupiter's despot, Dogati just sits there for a moment, completely unfazed, and then proceeds to let out a mild chuckle. Having had enough of it, the Gundam pilot proceeds to shoot his glass aquarium, breaking the glass. However, as the smoke settles and the water stops flowing out, both the Jupiter forces and the Crossbone Vanguard troops stand still in astonishment. A humanoid figure rises from the ruins, leaping towards Kincaid. It looks like Dogati, though his appearance is now more evocative of a machine than man. And whatever this abomination is, it tries to strangle Kincaid alive. Although these efforts are cut short by Zabine grabbing one of the Jovian rifles and beheading the creature with one well-aimed swing. Looking at the decapitated body of it, the space pirates quickly realize that it was a decoy. 
Suddenly, a voice coming from the aquarium catches their attention. It's the ruler of the Jupiter Empire himself. President Dougherty explains to them that while their mission was technically successful, it turns out the guy had cloned his mind into a set of nine bio units, with their originator being currently at the helm of the main Jupiter Empire attack force. Simply put, the Jovian dictator is in another castle, and since he is an asshole, he also rigged the place to blow. In around five and a half minutes. He also doesn't care about the collateral damage. Gee, what an upstanding guy. With the Mother Vanguard being stuck in place for the time being, Kinkade goes for the most straightforward course of action, preventing the explosion in the first place. Unfortunately, the staff at the base doesn't have the code needed to defuse the charges, with the base commander uttering that the only ones who know it are either Dogati or his blood relatives. Shit. As such, the plan B becomes destroying the ignition fuse, which in this case is a set of engines. The problem is, there is only one way to get there, and it is quite narrow, though fortunately, it's still big enough for the X1 to go through. As the tunnel curves, enemy forces start to pour in. While Kincaid does manage to rip one of them apart using the heat knife in X1's shoe, it has become apparent that these guys are going to be a serious hindrance. The Gundam pilot tries to talk some sense into them, but going by the replies, he quickly finds out that he has to switch to the language of five fingers and metal knuckles. Since the timer on the detonation is still ticking, Kincaid is growing increasingly frustrated, which is understandable, especially with a minute left on the clock. Back inside the throne room, Tobia and the Zondo gay pilots are forced to repel the Jupiter forces, which are making their way inside. 30 seconds later, only two enemy mobile suits remain in the tunnel which Kincaid proceeds to cut down to one within five seconds. He is so close to the fuses, but at the same time, the time is running short. Not to mention the last remaining enemy proceeds to cling on to his X1, slowing it down. At this point, the timer is showing single digits. Just a few more meters, just a few more seconds. The timer suddenly stops, just as Kincaid finally reaches the engines. The detonation has been averted, though not by him. In the throne room, the space pirates look towards one of the consoles, spotting a person of a short stature. Dogati's robot head lying on the floor is almost as surprised as the crossbone vanguard troops. The person in the spacesuit lets out a sigh, taking off her helmet. It's Bernadette, who wastes no time and gets on the Dullahan puppet's case. Turns out, Crux Dogati is her father revealing that Bernadette's birth name was Tetanif Dogati. The girl also reveals that Crux is an asshole. Well, who would have thought? Meanwhile, near one of the Jupiter Empire's colonies, a ship sets off for a course towards Earth. Its cargo, death. The game is on. In the aftermath of the battle on EO, the Crossbone Vanguard is repairing their flagship's mast. Tobia comments that this operation was quite costly for them. The ship's ammunition, medical supplies, not to mention spare parts on board, were all used up. Fortunately, the Jovian survivors on the moon have agreed to help with the repairs. Nonetheless, Mother Vanguard has been thoroughly beat up, and both the spirits and the energy of the crew on board is at an all-time low. Even so, after the repairs are complete, the flagship of the space pirates finally takes off. With the Jupiter forces heading for Earth, the Crossbone Vanguard has no choice but to chase after it. And yet, yeah, you also get this nice page of the X1 and X2 sitting on the speeding ship. Aboard the giant transport ship of the Jupiter Empire stands a familiar face. It's Barnes Gernsback, who had been requested on board by Professor Karras, who is currently sitting in a sofa. The professor briefly inquires into the man's background, but then cuts straight to the chase. Lieutenant Barnes is to be reassigned to a special team under Keras. This is a specialized fighting force that is currently free mobile suit strong. Giri Gadayuka Aspis is the leader of the team. He's also a petty asshole, which becomes an actual plot point later on. He's definitely a special case, that's for sure. Back on the Crossbone Vanguard's flagship, Bernadette lets the rest of the crew know about her father. 
She argues that the reason why she stowed away wasn't any sort of an ulterior motive and that she just wanted to go to Earth. Which is why she traveled undercover as an exchange student and eventually got involved in this mess. Even after defecting to space pirates, she thought it would be prudent to keep her cover. I'd say she makes a decent case and after a brief pause, the captain seems to agree. Also, note that Tobia was nervously holding something in his left hand before the final decision was made, that will also be important later on. With Bear officially vouching for the little stowaway, Tobia lets out a sigh of relief. Some of the crew members may be a little iffy about it, but that should pass. Zabine is being his usual shady self and we get another shower segment, though it's a character moment first and foremost. Bera somewhat sympathizes with Bernadette's predicament, since she was in a similar predicament in the past. The little girl talks about her father and then turns the topic to Bera and Kincaid, which gets the redhead captain flustered. Bera also reassures Bernadette that she didn't do anything wrong by leaving the Jupiter Empire and that she should think for herself more when it comes to what she's going to do from this point onwards. Going back to her quarters, Bernadette sits down on the bed. Suddenly, she hears a knock coming from the wall. It's Tobia. He climbed in through the air vent to check up on her. From their conversation, we find out that the stowaway girl got grounded. Ish. There's still some suspicion towards her on part of the crew, so Bera suggested she sticks around here for a while until such sentiments winds down. Tobia lets her know that he had a contingency plan just in case, and now that the situation from earlier got diffused, he now has to dismantle it. Suffice to say, he likes Bernadette a lot, even saying that if he had to, he'd fight every single person on the ship to ensure that the girl is unharmed. There's some maintenance taking place on the Mother Vanguard's exterior. As it turns out, the mast is not fully repaired, but for the time being, it should hold. Which is good news, given that the ship's sail is basically a high-performance propulsion system, allowing for fast space travel at a little to no upkeep. Think of it as an earlier version of the Wings of Light from Victory Gundam, though much larger which explains why it has been put on a massive ship like the Mother Vanguard. Tobia Ernax is helping out too, alongside Kincaid and a few Crossbone Vanguard members. They briefly touch on their odds against the Jupiter Empire, which are not optimistic to say the least, while Kincaid reassures the pirate kid that they won't opt for kamikaze as cramming maneuvers, they are still in a fairly desperate situation, especially with the supplies running short. Another big problem is how this realization will start weighing on the crew. While Yona from the former Zondo Gay team says they've got old man Umon on the lookout for Zabine, she can't help but worry a little. Back inside, Umon suddenly senses trouble, but before he gets to do anything about it, he gets intercepted and knocked out by one of Zabine's lackeys. The one-eyed soldier proceeds to barge into Bernadette's quarters taking her hostage. Heading for the bridge, he declares mutiny as he holds the ship's captain at gunpoint. Fortunately enough, one of the remaining loyal crew members does give a heads up to Kincaid's team outside, just in time for the Gundam pilot to turn around and take care of the trio of Zabine's loyalists sent after him. After doing so, Yona, Tobia and Kincaid rush back on board. Meanwhile, on the bridge, Zabine explains the motive behind his betrayal. Long story short, he never grew out of his cosmo-aristocracy face and he is about to make it everyone's problem. Not only that, but he also plans to pull a Shapiro Keats and ally himself with the Jupiter Empire, using the hostages at the Mother Vanguard as a bargaining chip. He's an asshole, and a twisted one at that, even praising the Empire's ruthless methods and saying that given Dogati's despotic rule, he'll fit right home. However, an odd silhouette approaching the ship interrupts his train of thought. It's the Jovians. To be specific, that's the Jibia class ship, a large attack craft of the Jupiter Empire, crewed by Professor Damien Karras and his forces, catching Kincaid and Toby off guard on their way to the bridge. As mentioned, Zabine intends to make a deal with the Jupiter Empire, hailing Keras over the comlink, 
with the two discussing the terms of the deal. Zabine wants Bera to remain unharmed, likely for his political scheming, to which Keras agrees under one condition. All the Crossbone Vanguard pilots on board, aside from Zabine, are to be handed over and more than likely executed, given the Jupiter Empire's track record thus far. As expected, the Bondi is being perfectly fine with throwing the rest of the pilots under the bus as well. Barra tries to call him out on his bullshit, but Zabine is somewhat preoccupied with daydreaming about autocracy in outer space to pay any attention to it. The man still has her, Bernadette, and some of the Zondo gay pilots at gunpoint, leading her down the corridor towards the hangar. This process is suddenly cut short by parts of the hallway suddenly erupting into flames. It's Tobias' contingency plan from earlier, with the pirate kid in question, rushing in to take Bernadette from his grasp. The one-eyed soldier is taken aback by this, but after a split second, he composes himself and fires his handgun. The shot barely misses Tobia, only grazing his cheek, but this does not stop the kid, who's having none of it at this point and straight up headbutts Zabine. Before the pilot of the X-2 manages to react, Jared, one of Old Man Umon's teammates, throws a knife into Zabine's hand, forcing him to drop the pistol. The guy cannot pull the trigger once you disable his hand, which is a fact that Tobia not only realizes, but he also bites the guy's arm for good measure. However, Zabine has two arms and punches Tobia away, beelining it for the exit. He may be getting away empty-handed, but it's a getaway nonetheless. Having finally arrived to the bridge, Kincaid proceeds to give chase after the traitor. Back on the Jibia-class ship, Professor Keras shrugs off Zabine's failure and orders Geary to sortie. The ship is ready to attack, and Keras is more than eager to do so, closing in on Mother Vanguard as the crew on board can only helplessly watch as the Jibia approaches. It appears to be going for some sort of a ramming maneuver, forcing the deputy captain, who remained on board, to try and evade it. Unfortunately for the space pirates, the enemy vessel is purpose-built for melee combat in mind, with the Jibia-class ship tearing a hole in Mother Vanguard and causing chaos on board. Since Dogate's daughter is still inside the ship, Keras tells his subordinates to wait with the gas. One of the war crime-related parts of their plan and launch the Death Kill Squadron instead. At the moment, though, the adversary that Kincaid is preoccupied with is Zabine in his Crossbone Gundam X2. Zabine is almost elated that he finally gets to settle an old score and charges Kincaid, though as their sabers clash, the wound on the one-eyed soldier's hand makes him falter and get pushed back. However, before Kincaid can capitalize on the opening, their battle gets interrupted by a blurry silhouette, briefly separating them. Zabine makes his escape, and before Kincaid tries to catch up, a set of explosions cut off the X-1's path, which is followed by three mobile suits landing onto the Mother Vanguard. It's the Death Gale team. The menacing trio lands in a tight formation, facing Kincaid and itching to commence their attack. All three of these are custom models, each tailor-made for its pilot. The smallest machine of the formation is the insect-like Abiho, followed by the long-armed Quaverze and the bulky, dark-colored machine, appropriately named Tortuga. As their visor covers click in place, were introduced to each of the Death Gale pilots. Hiri Gadeyuka Aspis is the leader of the team, piloting the Quaverze, Rosemary Raspberry using the Abiho, and Barnes sitting inside the Tortuga. With a single blink of an eye, the Death Gale team launches a coordinated attack on the Kincaid's machine, with the Abiho trying to flank it. The Gundam pilot does manage to react to it, but this enemy is simply too fast, hitting the X-1 with what appears to be a needle gun. Kincaid has barely any time to recollect, before having to face the Quaverse. The enemy machine uses one of the whip-like weapons mounted on its arms to lunge at Kincaid. And while the pirate does mostly evade the attack, it still cuts into the X-1's mantle. This is followed by a horizontal swipe that tears up the front of the mantle. But before a possible third attack takes place, Kincaid quickly assembles his beam rifle and fires at the machine from up close. 
while the enemy does manage to block it. He charges in to engage in melee, but the Quaverse pulls back. The Red Machine takes cover behind the Tortuga, which Kincaid tries to hit by throwing a Beam Saber. He doesn't miss, but the attack gets blocked by the giant Beam Shield on Tortuga's back. Suddenly, Kincaid comes to a startling realization. Each of the three mobile suits within the Death Gale team have been designed and made to counter the Crossbone Vanguard's tactics. Having noticed this, he yells at the approaching Batal pilots to stay back, but one of them, Ronim, ignores the warning and tries to charge the massive Tortuga. Jumping in, he lands a hit on the machine, but suddenly realizes one thing way too late. Upon piercing the Tortuga's outer armor, the arm of his machine got coated in a quickly hardening adhesive, trapping him and leaving him open for a strike from the Tortuga's arms. The captured Batala gets promptly shredded right in front of Kincaid. Using the element of surprise, the Quaverse attacks the Gundam pilot, and before he can react, it slices X-1's right arm, using the second whip-like weapon to take out the left hand as well. The pirate's machine may be a double amputee, but that doesn't make it any less dangerous. Kincaid readies his stance and prepares for a fight. The winds of death begin to blow. Things are looking quite bleak on the Mother Vanguard as well. The damage is heavy, the ship is surrounded, and their current fighting force is composed of a single crossbone Gundam and a few EMS-06 Batalas that have been captured from the Jupiter forces. Speaking of the X-1, the unit is still keeping up with its three adversaries, albeit barely. Rosemary begins laughing at Kincaid's defiant struggle, but still admits that the trio can't land a single hit on him. The Quaverse's pilot charges Kincaid, fully aware of the Gundam's hidden weaponry, but the pirate uses the red machine as a springboard. Nice. Old man Umon tries to help out, but his batal is forced back into cover by a burst of needle gunshots. Awaiting another wave of attacks, Kincaid notices another thing about his attackers. Sure, they are built to exceed the performance of the X-1, but each of them is optimized to supersede him in a single aspect. Giri in the Quaverse serves as the attacker, sporting superior melee reach using a pair of metal whips known as snake hands, which have circular beam blades at their tips. The large one, Tortuga, is the team's shield and the small Abiho is there to intercept his movements. This is a formation using the strong suits of each of their respective units. As such, their patterns become quite predictable. In the distance, Zabine Sharu is observing the scene. He is tempted to join the Jovian combatants, but Professor Karras orders him to retreat into his ship. This frustrates the one-eyed soldier, but eventually he obeys the order. As he is pulling back towards the Gibeas hangar, his old grudge gets the better of him, and Zabine says something along the lines of King Kid, you better not die, not before our final showdown, before retreating into the hangar's darkness. At the same time, a familiar face enters the battlefield. It's Tobia, who managed to sortie in a past battle of all things. The boy charges at the Tortuga, but gets parried by the shield, and King Kid has to push him away from the whip attack that follows. It is quite clear that Tobia's usual Devil May Care tactics won't be of much help, so Kincaid tells Tobia to go back into the ship, but not before asking him a favor. Given that the pirate kid did manage to set improvised traps across the ship, Kincaid tells him that he should try attacking the enemy ship directly. After all, the Mother Vanguard may be out of ammo, but nowhere nearly out of options. With the Death Gale team approaching the Gundam pilot again, he thinks back at the realization he had earlier. Each of the three machines are specialized for a single purpose, and given Jupiter's production capabilities, this high performance should be offset by some kind of a shortcoming. Abiho is on the front of the formation, charging at Kincaid. However, the Gundam pilot's resolve doesn't waver a single bit, quite the opposite in fact. Kincaid stays put, letting the needle shots hit his machine sustaining only some light damage, fully capitalizing on Rosemary's surprise and continuing onward. Quaverse is the second one to attack, launching both snake hands after the X-1. 
but King Kid dodges the first attack. Using the momentum to launch a heat knife towards the Quaverse, it barely scratches it, but the pilot of the Red Machine is taken aback, with King Kid brushing past him, which leaves the Tortuga. The dark colored machine tries to parry his strike, but the Gundam pilot slips around, making good use of the Tortuga's low speed and bumps into it. The X-1's heat radiator opens, its thrusters light up at full output, and the machine actually pushes the Tortuga away. Still taken aback by it, Barnes is forced to look on as his machine is rammed into the ship. The Tortuga is launched into the ship's mast, piercing its base. With the mast partially detached already, Kincaid signals to the pirate kid, and Tobia is more than happy to oblige, and sets a few thrusters to max. The response is almost immediate, with the beam sail collapsing sideways and scaring the shit out of Geary, it brushes past him, descending upon the Jibia class, which is still holding the Mother Vanguard within its grasp. The beam flag on the top actually manages to hit the Jovian ship, with the beam burning a large hole into the Jibia class. Bera and Bernadette can actually see the full extent of the damage from the bridge, even briefly rejoicing at the fact. Regrettably, this celebration is cut short, as an unknown silhouette walks in through a corridor. It's Karis. Outside of the ship, Kincaid's machine slumps down amidst the smoke and debris. The mobile suit is now near inoperable, with both the thrusters and legs completely busted. In fact, the only thing that's holding him in place is a pair of hip-mounted anchors. The Gundam pilot almost lets out a sigh of relief but he stops upon noticing three familiar silhouettes closing in on him from above. The Death Gale team is back, this time to personally deliver their coup de grace. However, given how heavily their mothership is damaged, they have to retreat as well. This forces the trio to pull back to their ship, finally giving Kincaid some breathing room. For Tobia, however, this battle doesn't end. He heard of Bernadette's kidnapping from the bridge, and as such, he boards his Pez Batala and tries to intercept Professor Karras. While the boy does manage to catch Professor Karras and Bernadette in the hand of the mobile suit, Karras just keeps grinning and tells Tobia that he's not strong enough to catch him, or something along those lines. The pirate kid tries to call his bluff, but the professor was being perfectly serious, easily jumping out of the mobile suit's hand and blowing it up with a single hand grenade. The reason for the former being that Karras is the master of his craft, and the latter happening to the fact that the armor of the Pez Batala is fucking flimsy, to put it lightly. He also lobs another grenade at the machine's torso, concealing Tobia in a fiery blaze. After a brief plot summary, courtesy of Volume 4, we get a better look at the grenade's impact. The explosion took out the main camera and damaged multiple internal systems though the pilot of the Pez Batala remains relatively unscathed. Tobia tries to go after Karras, even without a functioning camera, intending to rely on his eyesight, but the professor did account for that possibility as well. He points his pistol at the kid and hits him square in the chest. As the Jibia class leaves, the laugh of Professor Karras can be heard in the distance. And if you're wondering whether Tobia died or not, well, the manga's being fairly blatant about the pirate kid being alive, albeit a little groggy and under the weather. Turns out he was captured by the Jupiter forces, shortly after getting shot by Karras, and restrained inside an unfamiliar room. However, Tobia's confusion quickly fades once the voice of Professor Karras enters the room. The boy is understandably pissed, especially after the professor taunts him about the shape Mother Vanguard and its crew are probably in. Nonetheless, he remains in the empty room, with Karis telling him that he's been sentenced to death over the speaker. Tobia tells him to fuck off, but at the same time, the thought makes him grit his teeth a little. His thoughts then drift to burn dead. Speaking of Dogati's daughter, she is elsewhere on the ship, being escorted to see her father. She walks down the corridor, arriving in front of a glass tank, and facing down Crux Dogati's decrepit silhouette. Crux Dogati tries to address his daughter, but she shuts him down, knowing full well that the person in front of her is one of Dogati's clones. 
However, he reassures the girl that he is the real thing. Another two silhouettes of Dogatis appear in the tank, with one in the middle asking Bernadette which one is the real one. To add insult to injury, more Dogati clones show up, and one of them answers her surprise with an explanation. In this state, each of the clones is a near-perfect replica of her father, down to his personality, mannerisms and even thoughts. Seeing her terrified look, the Dogati clone asks her a single question. What does she want? Bernadette simply replies that she wants the invasion of Earth to stop, to which the Jupiter's ruler bursts into laughter, with the laugh resonating amidst his clones. The truth is, he didn't merely send his forces to Earth in order to conquer it. In fact, his plans are much, much more wretched. He could care less about military conquests. Even if he took over the blue planet, it wouldn't bring him any satisfaction. He also doesn't care whether his daughter lives or dies either. The only reason he has for keeping her around is to keep up appearances. Returning back to the topic of his intentions, he states that for the purpose of his plan, the Earth isn't even necessary. Elsewhere on the ship, Zabine is getting strung up and tortured. Turns out, the main disadvantage of going full Shapiro Keats is that you are going to be beaten to a pulp since the Jupiter Empire's forces don't trust him yet. Especially Giri, but Giri is a dick, so I suppose it serves the traitor right. Even so, the one-eyed soldier insists on his spiel, ranting about how he's on board with the Dogati regime. Devigail's commander still doesn't buy it and orders his troops to fry him some more. Observing the scene, Barnes Gernsback gets disgusted and turns to leave. It is clear that Giri is doing so mainly out of sheer spite. However, before he departs, Rosemary, who's also in the room, strikes a brief conversation with him. As it turns out, Giri is a new type, who has been given command over the team to test his aptitude, and Rosemary admits that as long as it brings in results, she doesn't really care about the means. Another part of the ship is filling with a different kind of noise. It appears to be some sort of a coliseum, and the excitement is palpable as the Jovian guards bring in a new fighter. It's Tobia. He has been sentenced to death, but given his notoriety, the firing squad was replaced by an arena. Another reason why he is dragged into the Coliseum is that Professor Keres personally arranged it. As it turns out, Keres is a social Darwinist. Well, calling him one would be an understatement. The man believes the same thing as Akame Gakil's character Esdef, albeit without a sizable rack to accompany the sheer madness and malice of these ideas. Long story short, he wants Tobia to fight to the death and either emerge victorious or die as a weakling. Not having much to say in response, the pirate kid shrugs and proceeds to the arena, armed with an automatic rifle. He brandishes the weapon, awaiting his opponent. His calls don't go unanswered, as a hole opens up in the arena. The crowd goes wild as the boy realizes what he's up against, the crossbone Gundam X2. It's Zabine's machine, standing at almost 16 meters tall and catching Tobia off guard. The machine takes a step towards Tobia, who is briefly frozen in disbelief. As the announcer clarifies, the boy is to fight against the pilot of the X-2, with the victor receiving an official pardon. The X-2 wastes no time and tries to flatten Tobia with its foot. However, the pirate kid dodges and returns fire with the rifle prompting X2 to lunge at him with the giant lance, but the sheer size and weight of the weapon makes it unwieldy for hitting such a small target, with this attack failing to hit him as well. His mechanized adversary tries to pursue him, and we quickly learn who's in the cockpit of the crossbone Gundam X2, Rosemary Raspberry. The pilot of the X2 suddenly changes her strategy and uses the machine's right arm to grab Tobia. Seemingly, he's done for with Rosemary pondering whether to land the killing blow immediately or whether to be slower about it. However, Tobia is a fast thinker, pointing his rifle at the gap between X2's fingers and pulling the trigger. After a brief moment, he manages to set off the mobile suit's dummy launcher, forcing it to release a large inflatable decoy balloon, freeing him from the machine's metal grasp. Using its upward momentum, the pirate kid grabs onto it 
in order to reach a more advantageous position. With Tobia on the Gundam's head, and with the decoy balloon right in front of him, the boy proceeds to shoot it, making the balloon pop like a piece of inflated bubblegum. The rubbery remains of the decoy land onto the Gundam, covering its face and rendering the pilot effectively blind. Rosemary tries to open the cockpit in order to locate the pirate kid, realizing way too late that she had made a fatal mistake. Tobia swings into the cockpit, kicking the woman off and stealing the captured Gundam. With a swift motion, he also rids the machine of its rubber blindfold, after which he turns his attention towards the Coliseum's balcony, approaching Bernadette and one of Dogatee's clones, the latter of which quickly retreats. The blonde girl recognizes Tobia, hopping into the X2's cockpit as the two make their escape. The situation outside the Colosseum can be described as an utter, unadulterated chaos. The ships command even dispatches their usual patrol machines. Yes, these. Against this. It goes without saying that Tobia punts them out of the air, with Professor Karras watching him in awe, as the Gundam inches closer and closer to freedom. The command center of the ship isn't doing any better either, watching powerlessly as the machine rampages through the ship. Suddenly, the X2 pops up on one of the displays. The Gundam is outside. I'm being very particular with my words. The Gundam is outside. As expected, the Jeeper forces are more than eager to chase after it, disregarding any and all possible costs. During the preparations, one of the Jovians notices an abnormality in one of the storehouses, but disregards it, having different priorities at the moment. However, it still catches the attention of Barnes Gernsback of the Death Kill team. As you might have guessed, Tobia managed to jerry-rig one of the boosters on board onto the X2 score fighter, with Bernadette helping out with supplies. Suddenly, a familiar figure enters the room. It's Lieutenant Barnes. He commands the kid's masterful distraction, and despite his seemingly futile efforts to catch up with the Mother Vanguard, the Jovian soldier is willing to look the other way and let him flee. Under one condition, Bernadette has to stay behind. While Tobia isn't too receptive to the offer, given the condition, the girl reassures him that everything will be fine. She is still holding on to the hope that she can change the mind of her wicked father. With time being of the essence, she gives Tobia a smooch and sees him off. The engines on the booster light up and the core fighter starts to flee into the emptiness of space, with the Jovians on the main ship catching a brief glimpse of its silhouette. Ultimately though, the Jubra forces choose not to pursue him, given both the speed of his craft and the slim chances of it reaching its goal. Three days later though, one of Dogatee's underlings comes up with surprising news. They received a transmission from one of the Jovian reconnaissance units. Apparently, the kid's core fighter had reached its mothership. Given the unlikeliness of such a development, the Jupiter's ruler lets out a playful laugh, intrigued by the occurrence. Back in the core fighter, Toby lies collapsed on the seat. After three days, three tiresome days, he finally made it. Having docked in the hangar, he sees Kincaid, alongside with other Crossbone Vanguard pilots, rejoicing at his return. The crew on the bridge is happy to see him as well, with Yona and old man Umon commenting on how unlikely his return seemed from such a long distance. Though Tobia admits that he pulled it off partially by calculating the trajectory and partially by hoping that the ship would be in one piece by the time he arrived. For the pirate kid, his return to the Mother Vanguard is quite bittersweet, given that while he got to see his friends again, the boy did have to leave Bernadette behind. He makes a promise to himself that even if it's the last thing he'll do, he will save Bernadette from the Empire's grasp. Tobia also tells the ship's captain about what Crux Dogatee disclosed to his daughter about his plans. There is one specific part of it that sticks out to Bera. To control humanity, Earth wouldn't be necessary. Given how disconnected Jupiter is from the Earth in many ways, such a statement means nothing but trouble, especially coming from Dogati himself. At this point it's safe to assume that, to quote the ship's captain, 
The man is a genuine danger to humanity. However, despite the fact that Mother Vanguard is chasing after the Jubilus fleet, the nature of traveling between the planets has assured that the two factions are currently in an enforced stalemate for the time being, especially considering that any combat that would take place would be a heavy drain on fuel and resources. The mothership of the Crossbone Vanguard also hasn't fully recovered from its most recent battle, which in turn shattered any hopes of outpacing the Jovians on their race towards Earth. It's still a long way to go, about two and a half months before the Jupiter fleet reaches the Earth. As such, the crew of Mother Vanguard chooses to make the best of the downtime they have been given. Kincaid, Tobia, the ship's mechanic and a few others are going over what machines they may be up against, specifically the Death Kill team. The team Squaverse unit is what piques the old mechanic's interest in particular, seeing how well equipped it is for fighting against the usual melee focused tactics of the Crossbone Vanguard. The machine's snake hand weapons will definitely be bothersome to deal with. Fortunately, the mechanic has devised a counter against it, using the materials currently on the ship. It's an improvised solution, but a working one nonetheless. By the time the mothership of Crossbone Vanguard had reached Earth's sphere, the ruler of Jupiter has ingratiated himself with the Earth Federation, presenting the olive branch in one hand and concealing the proverbial dagger in the other, with Fedis being none the wiser. Back on the mothership of the Space Pirates, Barra's musing over Dogati's plans suddenly gets interrupted by the comms officer. They've got company, though this time it's not necessarily bad news. A ship by the name of Eos Nix is heading their way, carrying a messenger with Sinri affiliations. It's Sheridan Rona, Barra's cousin, whose relatives still cling onto their space aristocracy ideals and as such have a lot of sway with certain factions. Tobia is understandably baffled by this, since he sees the way high status is earned in such a system as quite arbitrary. At the same time, Old Man Umon does tell him that regardless of his thoughts on the matter, some people do find the prospects of being ruled by people of higher status appealing, with Barra scolding the pirate kid for saying something like that, on a ship filled with people who were originally on board with their own factions movements for space monarchy. Anyways. Eos Nix has arrived, with Sheridan and supplies on board as well. As the ship docks, Barra goes to meet Sheridan Rona herself, accompanied by Tobia. Upon seeing the boy, Barra's cousin gives him a warm yet eerie smile. Unsolicited tangents on Sheridan's part notwithstanding, there is a new mobile suit on board, the Crossbone Gundam Unit 3. Tobia is excited about the news eyeing out the new model and even trying to guess what equipment does the machine come with. On the other side of the ship, Sheridan and Barra proceed to strike up a conversation, and we quickly find out that Sheridan is quite the oddball. First she says that Tobia could become a powerful new type, fully intending on keeping him as her protege slash property, but Barra shuts her down. After which, Sheridan drops a bombshell. She isn't handing over the supplies. As it turns out, she merely used the supplies from Sinri as a pretense to meet with Bera and convince her to stop fighting. Bera tries to reason with her, bringing up the factual reality that Dogati is fully intending to do god knows what to the earth, with diplomacy being the last thing that would even hinder him. They're a hostile force with access to poison gas and even actual nukes among other things. However, Sheridan remains insistent on her space hippie spiel. To her, the fact that there will always be factions like Jupiter Empire renders fighting meaningless. She is perfectly okay with giving them a free reign over the blue planet, as long as further battles are prevented. Of course, Bera calls her on her bullshit, but she notices something out of the ship's window. The Federation forces have arrived, mainly composed of the Shars Rebellion era cruisers and battleships with the only new addition to the fleet being a set of reinforced class light cruisers. As it turns out, Sheridan double-crossed them. She contacted the Air Federation forces in order to strong-arm the Crossbone Vanguard into laying down their arms. As Federation mobile suits start to gather around Mother Vanguard, Old Man Umon perfectly describes their predicament. They're up against the forces of EFF, 
while at the same time, if they were to fight, they'd have to do so with one of their arms behind their back. One of the Federation ships sends out the message which is loud and clear. The space pirates are to lay down their arms and let themselves get detained. Understandably, panic erupts at the bridge of Mother Vanguard. The space pirates are in a situation where they can't afford a fight with the Federation. They're more or less forced into turning themselves in and attending a trial during which they may possibly be able to make the Jupiter Empire's schemes public. Now, given Federation's track record when it comes to their treatment of prisoners, <coughs> Head away. The crew is very much against the prospect. Bera also tells her men that she will take the brunt of the blame, urging the crew to abandon ship if the opportunity presents itself. After this, she walks out of the room, with her usual composed self in tatters. Fortunately for her, she runs into Kincaid, who assures Bera that he'll be there for her no matter what. He might not be able to do much about their predicament, but he'll be there. An Earth Federation officer thanks Sheridan for her efforts. Meanwhile, elsewhere on the ship, Tobia is losing his shit. Sheridan had confined him into a small room while spouting her usual talking points. At roughly the same time, Mother Vanguard's crew is awaiting the Federation forces to arrive on board, with Kincaid being unable to shed a slight feeling of nostalgia upon sighting multiple Gundam F-91s closing in. He concludes that the main reason why any possible resistance on the Crossbone Vanguard's part would likely be cut short is that most of their mobile suits are built for fighting at close to mid-range, which obviously becomes a problem when up against the Federation's numerical and range advantage. Suddenly a speeding silhouette emerges from the darkness of space. It's the X2, well X2 Kai to be specific, and it wastes no time opening fire upon an Earth Federation ship and even destroying it using its beam launcher. The Federation officer from earlier takes it as a pirate attack, with the culprit in question taunting the battleship's crew by flying past their bridge. It's Sabine, fully intent on wreaking havoc and forcing the Federation's hand. His plan is quite effective, with the Fedi officer ordering all ships to open fire upon Mother Vanguard. The shots rock the hull, from Think Kincaid to Sori. It is once again time for him to fight, even with the odds being egregiously lopsided against him. A few Batala pilots also follow suit. Approaching one of the Federation's F-91s, he draws a beam saber and starts closing the distance. He also advises his squad mates against using beam shields, given that they won't stop the VSBR rifles of the F-91 Gundams anyway. Observing the scene, Sheridan lets out a frustrated sigh. Having reached the first F-91, Kincaid takes it by surprise. With a quick cut, he proceeds to dispatch the first one, slicing its arm and beam rifle apart. The Federation pilots try to stop him, but Kincaid's machine dodges and weaves around their VSBR shots, hitting some of the F-91s along the way. Briefly remarking on enemy's lackluster performance, the Crossbone Gundam pilot approaches a Federation ship and prepares to swing at its cannons. Suddenly, a strong blast brings a stop to his rampage. With the Gundam's anti-beam mantle getting vaporized on hit, Kincaid spots the source of the attack. It's a blue Gundam F-91, piloted by Harrison Madden of the Earth Federation forces. The pilot orders his men to stay back, preparing for a fight. The faceplates of both machines open up as the skirmish commences. At roughly the same time, the mothership of Crossbone Vanguard is facing quite the predicament. The ship has been under fire from Federation forces, sustaining heavy damage and likely won't last much longer if this keeps up. However, this isn't all as far as bad news are concerned. The Jupiter forces are approaching. As stated by the Empire's ruler, it's all going according to their plan. Still fighting the blue F-91, Kincaid catches a glimpse of the Mother Vanguard which is currently in a rough state. In the distance, he can also see the silhouettes of the approaching Jupiter forces. The sheer speed of both F-91 and Kincaid's machines keep the two somewhat evenly matched. With the only good hit the space pirate gets in, only tearing off one of F-91's cooling fins. Harrison's unit responds with a point-blank machine cannon and Vulcan's barrage, forcing Kincaid to deploy his beam shield. This is the first time anyone forced him to do so. It still won't do much against the VSBR rifles that the blue F-91 
quickly switched to. King Kate tries to dodge the VSBR shots while gradually closing the distance, until suddenly the F-91 gets a lock on his machine. With some quick thinking, King Kate quickly detaches both beam shields and throws them forward. Shortly before Harrison's VSBR fires, the shot pierces both shields, decreasing in power as it passes through each of them. With a much thinner beam of light flying at Kincaid, who readies his beam saber almost as if he's intending to block it. In an unexpected turn of events, his machine does manage to pull it off, though some of the particles from the VSBR shot still scratch up his cameras and sensors. With Kincaid's Gundam reaching melee range, its pilot proceeds to completely disarm the F-91 with a single hit, heavily damaging Harrison's machine. The Federation pilot starts thinking he's done for, even awaiting the final strike. But Kincaid holsters the beam saber and rushes back to his ship. On the Mother Vanguard, the Batal pilots are having quite a hard time with Death Gale Team Squaverse. However, the red machine suddenly stops in place. Kincaid now has returned. This time around, his X-1 has had a few upgrades, so despite damaged sensors, he should be more than well equipped for the upcoming fight. He charges in, with the rest of the Jovian trio arriving onto the scene as well. Meanwhile, still trapped on Sheridan's ship, Tobia overhears something interesting from a Federation broadcast. Apparently, Bernadette will be joining the fight as well. The girl is awoken from her rest, given a change of clothes, and escorted to Dogati's fish tank. Her father tells her the story in a mobile armor. The machine in question is automated, and should she perish, it will only serve to motivate his forces. Simply put, Crux Dogati intends on using his own daughter as an expendable pawn. He even starts boasting about how his clone form has rid him of certain hindrances. In fact, he sees Bernadette as yet another hindrance, something to get rid of. Sitting in the cockpit of EMA-06 Elego Rella, Bernadette's thoughts proceed to focus on Tobia, as some sort of a call for help. The pirate kid in question is still on EO Snix, though no longer locked in the room. Tobia's resourcefulness allowed him to make a break for it, flee the room, and even start making his way towards the hangar. But suddenly, the boy stops, noticing a familiar silhouette. It's Sheridan, standing in his way and being seemingly apathetic to her cousin's current predicament. She even tries to convince Tobia, who, as she asserts, is also a new type of her standpoint. Sheridan also attempts to appeal to my new type potential, insisting that if he leaves, his soul will only be dragged down. Her spiel continues, but Tobia's confused expression gradually transforms into a smirk. At first, he thought that Bearer releasing POWs into outer space was naive, but this this is beyond delusional. Even with the guards barging in, the boy steps forward, telling Sheridan to get out of his way. He could care less about any sort of new type gobbledygook. All he knows is that he is human, and being human is enough. Toby also emphasizes his point by landing a pretty solid left hook on her and starting to walk away. He charges the guard standing in his way, stealing his knife and returning to Sheridan. Showing her his arm, he drags the blade across the back of his arm, creating a shallow yet quite visible wound, almost as a display of his resolve. Some of the guards try to pursue him, but the now heavily whimpering Sheridan holds them off. Having hopped into the new model, Crossbone Gundam X3, Tobia sheds the large cloth covering the machine. The eyes light up, as the X3 stands up. The boy had made a promise, and he will keep it, leaving Eos Nix through a hole he made in its hull. He sets the machine's thrusters to max, and starts heading towards Mother Vanguard. As Tobia finally sorties, a specialized Jupiter formation exits the main Jovian battleship. It's composed of a single EMA-06 mobile armor, escorted by a squad of EMS-08 Dionas. Seeing the current state of Mother Vanguard, one of the Diona pilots remarks that at this rate, the ship will be in pieces by the time their formation reaches it. After all, their machines are there for demonstration purposes, so such a scenario would be for the better. The chatter among Jupiter's forces is suddenly cut short by a thundering roar, almost freezing them in place. The originator of the sound is the distant silhouette, speeding towards them, is the X-3. 
piloted by Tobia, who's dead set on being the man of his word. This is also where we get a nice page spread featuring the Crossbone Gundam X3 in its entirety. Upon sighting the boy's machine, the Diona pilots open fire at the approaching Gundam. Tobia tries to turn on a beam shield to block them, but he quickly learns that the X3 has none. Instead, the button activates the machine's eye field, deflecting the incoming beam shots. The pirate kid also notices that there is a time limit to the arm-mounted beam deflection barriers, limiting their use to 105 seconds per each arm, with a 2-minute recharge time after the time is up. Unimpeded by the beam shots, the pirate kid proceeds to grab one of the Dionas and shoves them over. Back at the Mother Vanguard, King Kate is fighting the Death Girl team. Suddenly, he hears a familiar voice over the comms. It's Tobia, who tells him to try and hold out a little more, with the boy planning to come to his aid. King Kate finally unveils the weapon that the ship's mechanic was working on earlier. It is a long whip, featuring a metal drill bit on its tip. The space pirate swings it catching the snake hand of Giri's machine. He also informs Tobia that their mothership likely won't last any longer. Bera has already set off the self-destruct sequence for it a while ago, with the crew heading off to escape pods. In five minutes the ship is set to explode, and around that time the space pirates will try and make a run for it. If Tobia can escape as well, Kincaid asks him to take care of Bernadette and Bera, before turning his focus back on fighting the Red Jovian machine. Suddenly the Quaverse disappears out of his sight. He is surrounded by smoke coming from the ship, with the Jupiter's mobile suits nowhere to be seen. However, a black silhouette emerges from the smoke. It's Zabine, and he's here to settle an old score. Meanwhile, Tobia finally draws his machine's weapon, even landing a strike on one of the Dionas. Mind you, this is supposed to be a beam weapon, and he doesn't even bother turning it on, being perfectly content with tearing his foes apart with sheer blunt force. What remains of the formation is left stunned at the boy's fighting style, though Tobia sees it somewhat differently. Admittedly, he grabbed whatever weapon was on board, and as such he doesn't have the slightest clue how to operate the damn thing. Suddenly, the mobile armor springs into action, ordering the rest of the team to fall back. It's the Elego Rela unit, with Bernadette strapped on board as a hostage. Using the last few seconds of the operation time for X3's left arm field, Tobia parries the strike. He tries to break Bernadette out, but the only result of his efforts is a loud, cackling voice coming from the mobile armor. One of Dogadi's clones is piloting the machine, with the Elego Rela still making a swipe at the X3. To further taunt the boy, he also uncovers its cockpit displaying Bernadette sitting on board as a hostage. Tobia rightfully calls Dogati out for this, but to the Jovian despot there isn't such a thing as a dirty tactic. Dogati even states that such is the nature of war, and by the extent the nature of humanity. The pirate boy tries to get a hit in, but has to hold back as to not hit Bernadette as well. On top of that, the right arm's eye field has reached its limit, going on cooldown. The mobile armor spots an opening, and lands a nasty hit on the X3. Its sword-like weapon falls out of X3's hand, with 13 seconds worth of recharge remaining for the left arm's eye field. The Elego Rella grabs the weapon, releasing the safety and turning on its thief-like beam blades. 8 seconds remain. Dogati's clone starts to approach Tobia's machine. 6, 5, 3, 2, the mobile armor swings the blade. Noticing the attack, the boy extends the X3's arm. The blade briefly turns into a blur and stops. Tobia caught the attack. This intrigues Dogati. The boy caught it using his machine's left arm, turning on its eye field the moment it became available. However, Tobia isn't satisfied with merely stopping the attack, pressing the weapon in his grasp into the mobile armor's thick shell. The blade deals heavy damage to the mobile armor, with the Elego Rella's performance falling drastically. Tobia also rips out the cockpit holding Bernadette. After all, he is a pirate, and as such, he will plunder. Dodging the mobile armor's attacks, Tobia thrusts the giant sword into the mobile armor's cannon array, turning the beam blades on again. The response is immediate, with the mobile armor almost instantly erupting from inside. Having destroyed it, the pirate kid breaks Bernadette out of the cockpit, She's finally reunited with Tobia.
They are Crossbone Vanguard's mothership, or at least what currently remains of it. A battle still rages on. King Kate is down to a pair of beam sabers, with the camera sensors not being in too good of a shape either. To avoid having to fight effectively blind, he tears off a part of the X1 Kai's chest armor, opting to use his own eyes to see instead. With two minutes on the self-destruction timer, Barra decides to go out in a core fighter, against the wishes of her crew. King Kid was there for her when she needed him, so Barra chooses to repay the favor. She's carrying a pair of spare beam shields alongside two beam sabers and heading towards the front of the ship where King Kid and Zabine are fighting. As the beam sabers of the two clash, Zabine laments that if it weren't for King Kid, Barra would have remained with the Ronas and nothing would have stopped Blondie's dreams of space aristocracy. With a single move, the one-eyed soldier disarms King Kid's machine. Though before he can follow up on it, Barra flies in with the core fighter, firing its beam guns and forcing Zabine's machine back. However, it's still just a core fighter, with the X2 Kai hitting one of its thrusters by tossing a beam saber at it. Barra still manages to drop off the spare weapons and beam shield before having to retreat. King Kid reaches for the beam shield, but suddenly he notices Zabine approaching him with a beam saber. The one-eyed soldier lunges towards X1 Kai's torso, and the hit connects. Blondie lets out a triumphant laugh, having seemingly killed his opponent and decapitating his machine. For good measure, he also kicks it away. At this point, Tobia finally arrives, diving past Zabine's X2 Kai and heading for Mother Vanguard. There's less than 30 seconds on the countdown, with Barra watching on helplessly as King Kate's X1 Kai drifts towards the orbit. 20 seconds. Tobia retrieves the core fighter. With 15 seconds remaining, Zabine retreats, knowing full well that the ship is about to detonate. After a brief moment, Mother Vanguard explodes in a fiery blaze, with its debris flying everywhere. Crux Dogati watches the destruction from his ship, with a Nerf Federation officer thanking him for cooperation. However, among the many pieces of the spaceship falling onto the Earth, he spots a small metal container entering the atmosphere. It's an escape pod. By the time Tobia touches down on the blue planet, he's panting with exhaustion, with Bernadette being just as tired as he is. Nonetheless, the boy climbs out, seeing the planet's blue sky and feeling grass under his feet for the first time. Walking through the wilderness, even for a brief while, feels oddly serene. Suddenly, he panics, spotting a deer. This ends the sizable midsection of Crossbone's 1990s run, going from Volume 1 Chapter 4 all the way to Volume 5's second chapter. Suffice to say, this part is much longer, especially when compared to the previous one. We started on a fairly straightforward infiltration mission and the Crossbone Vanguard's uphill battle, which ended up with their mothership and their hopes of taking on the Jupiter Empire, both reduced to ashes. The ship is gone its crew scattered, Seabook Arno presumed dead, and Tobia left stranded on Earth alongside Bernadette and Cecily Fairchild. During both the battles and the brief character moments, we learned that things like King Kate's now policy of trying to reduce casualties had a much more heartfelt and personal reason behind them. Not to mention how a seemingly straightforward plan to uproot the Jovian faction quickly turned into a desperate struggle for survival. As is the tradition with most UC stories, the tonal shift had arrived, and it has hit hard. However, at the same time, where are survivors? There is also hope. But that would have to wait for the third part, which will conclude the story of the 90s manga. Honestly, I do not have the faintest clue when that one comes out. All that I'm certain of is that I need a breather, to say the least. If you've enjoyed this saga thus far, feel free to like, comment and subscribe. This is Shirtlaid, signing out. Less than 24 hours remain until Jupiter launches a full-scale attack to which they had already warned us of beforehand. All of the military installations on Earth have been rendered inoperative by the Jovian attack force, 
and it is at this point we believe it is no longer possible to send any further reinforcements to Earth's orbit. So this is the last of their pitiful efforts, insolent fools! The X-1! It's Kincaid! Oh, shit. The Jupitris has a weak spot in the construction block 8 and 9. If you need a spot to aim for, aim there. Hey, we gotta use this chance to beat him. This is Lieutenant Harrison of the Federation's 17th Mobile Force. We're aware of your intentions. Go on ahead, we'll lend you a hand. Oh, no you don't. <laughs> As the one who has lost, you should not stand in the winner's path. You really aren't human anymore, are you, Dogany? The time has come for part 3. In the aftermath of Crossbone Vanguard's skirmishes with the Jupiter Empire, the crew of the Mother Vanguard is left scattered and decimated. Following an especially tough one, the pirate kid Toby Aranax finds himself stranded on the Blue Planet, alongside Bernadette and Vera, who didn't even have the time to properly mourn the loss of her significant other before having to withdraw from the battlefield. The main Jupiter fleet has arrived to the Earth sphere to do god knows what, and the three pirates in the forest are left with a single landing pod and a crossbone Gundam X3. After Tobia's most recent encounter with the local wildlife, we get a shot of the now covered up visage of the X3. It's been 10 days since his desperate retreat from the battlefield with Vera and Bernadette in tow. From the looks of it, the trio is not alone in the forest, which is made evident as an old man with an ape on his shoulder hollers at the boy. The man seems to be piloting a machine made for clearing forests, and even though this all takes place roughly in the middle of Volume 5, we still get a brief summary of the recent events, the escape, and Tobia also adds that an old lumberjack took them in, offering a roof over their heads in exchange for some help with errands around the house. Returning to the old man's cottage. The boy does run into Bernadette as she's changing, and after a brief awkward moment, the two strike up a conversation. Bernadette remarks that she's still getting used to walking around under the Earth's gravity. It is gradually getting better day by day, to which Tobia replies that people weren't really meant to live in zero-gravity environments such as spaceships all the time. As for the Gundam, it's still in a bit of a rough shape. Even so, there should be some more survivors from the Mother Vanguard left, considering that multiple escape pods made it out before the ship's destruction. So it would be a good idea to restore communications and join up with them. There's still one variable which rouses both curiosity and concern on Tobias' part. Dogati. Things have been fairly quiet. A little too quiet. Not to mention, if the Elegorilla encounter is a sign of things to come, that leaves seven more BioBrain units, which will likely be used to operate Jovian mobile armors as well. His worried musing is interrupted by Bernadette, who seems to have a somewhat different outlook on matters pertaining to her father. Whether it is due to a level of naivete on her part or not, the girl states that the reason he sent her out in the Elagorilla mobile armor may have been to let her escape while keeping up appearances. While taken aback by this, Tobia chooses to concede that he doesn't know the Jupiter's despot personally, opting to somewhat take her word for it. At least that's what he says. Come night time. The air becomes filled with frequent noises that don't seem particularly conducive to getting a wink of sleep. Suffice to say, the old lumberjack really is sewing logs day and night. After a while, this prompts the pirate kid to go for a walk outside to escape the snoring, stumbling upon Vera next to a nearby lake. She reminisces about her earlier days, specifically about how she and Seabook used to row around the Frontier Force Colony Lake. Since this is technically the second time Vera referred to Kincaid now by his real name, Tobia asks the obvious. It's abundantly clear that she's taking the loss pretty hard, even saying that if she knew this war would lead to her losing Seabook, she wouldn't have gotten involved. As we've seen earlier, when she decided to begin fighting the Jupiter Empire, the man didn't even blink as he took up a moniker and chose to fight alongside her. Come to think of it. He was by her side for pretty much everything. Even before that, he fully dedicated himself to the single-minded effort of uprooting Jovian rule. 
which also forced the two to keep a level of distance between one another. When pressed on this, she tells Tobia that due to everyone being ridiculously busy, the couple barely had any time for themselves. For 10 years. Jesus Christ! Anyway, Tobia states that he understands the situation. After all, the boy also fought hard to protect someone dear to him, tapping into the same degree of determination. He also tells Bera his outlook on this pseudonym game, and that Seabook simply had to become King Kane in order for Bera to be Cecily again, for the lack of better words. Besides, the boy isn't fully convinced of his friend's passing. There's no way the pilot of the X-1 could go out easily like that. The former captain of the Mother Vanguard tries to calm him down, seeing his outburst as just another step before accepting the somber reality of the situation and an attempt to gain closure but Tobia remains undeterred. Things don't seem to be idle in space either, as the Jupiter Empire begins attacking the Air Federation forces, much to the surprise of the pirate kid, and prompting the old lumberjack to remark on the lopsidedness of the situation. As you can see, mass production batalas have started swiftly laying waste to Federation's space infrastructure, such as defense satellites and ships, even using nukes and catching the Fedi captain completely off guard, both terrified and confused. The captain tries to contact Dogati, yet his concerns are met with an unexpected response. The Jovian ruler casually states in no uncertain terms that he doesn't give a shit about the Antarctic Treaty or any Earth-made rules of war, doubling down on the flippant tone. He also says that in 48 hours he intends to nuke the Earth itself. It is worth noting that this is not a threat, nor a warning, nor a lie, simply a declaration. Long story short. Dogati's plan is simple, ravage the blue planet, scorch the surface, eradicate the Federation, and reign over the smoldering spoils of war. He hungers for a single goal, subjugation, and he doesn't seem to mind any and all collateral damage in the pursuit of it. For obvious reasons, the pilot of Crossbone Gundam X3 isn't really keen on idly watching on as it happens, and tries to acquire some spare parts to get his machine in top shape. Here's the thing though, according to the old lumberjack, the closest place one can get some is about 11 to 12 kilometers away, and there don't seem to be any vehicles available, meaning Tobia pretty much has to take a hike, quite literally. Despite how far it is, the boy soldiers on, walking along through the woods as he pants with exhaustion. Eventually, he collapses on the grass, remarking that if this were a colony, that distance would essentially constitute its diameter, which then gives him an epiphany. The people born and raised in space the sheer scale of the Earth's environment is almost completely foreign. That's why walking 12 kilometers seems like much, and that's why he got startled by a deer. In comparison, the animals in the colonies were often much smaller, most of them pets or assorted critters. Yet now he walks through the mountains, seeing much larger creatures roaming freely. Come to think of it, he's pretty sure that most people he's ran into before, both friends and foes, have also likely never experienced such things. The boy then thinks back at Sheridan's words, and makes a remark about people moving to space as he heads to town for the parts. At this point, the sun is already down, and Tobia is heading back in the company of the night sky. Suddenly, he stops, seeing birds fly out of the foliage in response to a silhouette he's all too familiar with. A red Jovian machine, the Quaverse, emerges from the tree line, cutting through the nearby branches using a pair of beam blades. The Jupiter forces are here. We see the encounter's outcome a few pages later, where Geary, the Quaversus pilot, and the rest of the Death Gale team has made their way to the old lumberjack's cottage, holding Tobia, Bernadette, Bera, and the old man himself at gunpoint. Funnily enough, the old man gets on their case for not taking their shoes off indoors. The TV inside is still on, currently describing the wanton destruction befalling Earth Federation bases left on Earth largely a courtesy of Death Gill. Besides seeing a bisected RGM-119 James gun, we also find out that Geary knows more than he lets on. On top of that, it seems that the Jovian pilot has been looking for Tobia, and the space pirate captain for reasons outside of Dogati's plan. Speaking of that one, Geary chooses to elaborate on it. As it turns out, enveloping the planet in nuclear fire isn't truly motivated by a desire for the Earth's resources. It is far more malicious. The crux, pun intended, of Crux Dogati's plan is to scorch the blue planet and reduce it into a dead ball of ash. 
The impetus behind doing so is to destroy a thing humanity is bound to, in order to make any sort of top-down control much easier. See, colonies themselves are largely self-sufficient, but at the same time, the view of Earth keeps them enthralled with its natural beauty and abundance of resources. If it were to be destroyed, the centralization of power would be much, much easier, if you think about it. The entirety of mankind would be forced to live inside colonies which would leave the populace at large, completely at the mercy of their respective governments. It's a tyrant's wet dream. Giri, being the asshole he is, doesn't really mind. Though one could argue his motivation is largely based on spite than anything else. He can't stand the bug noises. And he sure as hell can't stand the chimp perched up on the old man's shoulders. As he tries to shoot at the bugs outside, the lumberjack's hairy compatriot, whose name turns out to be Sebastian, makes a run for it. Giri also hands a projector to Tobia, which plays a message from a familiar crooked professor. As Karis explains, there will obviously be an era of turmoil after the Earth's destruction, and it will be up to Jupiter to try and subjugate the settlements in space. Obviously, Tobia's combat aptitude would be a great asset should he join them. End of message. Thing is, we all know for a fact that the pirate kid's answer will likely amount to fuck off and he indeed delivers. As such, Giri says that he'll kill him, and then moves on to the other prisoners. He singles out Bernadette, and proceeds to taunt Tobia with sleazy remarks, which, as we know, is not a particularly good idea. This pisses off the pirate kid something fierce. It doesn't matter that he is bound to a chair or not. He will not let the son of a bitch get away with something of that nature. He leaps forward, ramming the wooden chair against Giri's ribs and making the Jovian collapse to the ground. However, before any of his soldiers could intervene, the ground nearby starts to shake. A worker machine we've seen a bit earlier is rushing towards the cottage, bashing the wall to pieces and forcing everyone to get the hell out of Dodge. The machine treads through the cottage and knocks down Rosemary's Abijo with its flailing arms. The chimp is back. I repeat, the chimp is back. Oh yeah, and Tobia is finally rid of the ropes that bind him amidst the confusion. With the chaos afoot, the old man, Tobia, Vera and Bernadette beeline it for the nearby car the Jovian soldiers came in, with the lumberjack yelling at Sebastian to ditch the machine and flee as well. Tobia suggests they should head towards the Gundam, since the boy still has the replacement parts with him. He just needs to get up there and get it running. In the meantime, Giri got in his quaverse. Long story short, the chimp is in trouble. However, Sebastian isn't really keen on getting flattened alongside the worker machine and gets off just in time. We also see the rest of the Death Gale squadron start up their machines as well. Back at the Gundam, Tobia doesn't have much success with getting the X3 back up and running. The part is slotted in, but the mobile suit doesn't seem to be starting up. It doesn't seem to be moving, and what makes it worse is that the Death Gale's mobile suits are making their way towards their location. Suddenly, the old lumberjack gets an idea. That's right, he goes for the old reliable and gives the computer in the cockpit a strong whack with his fist. It works! With the X3 starting to move, the old man bails from the cockpit as the pirate boy prepares to engage. The first one to attack is Giri Scoverse. Thanks to the arm-mounted eye field though, the X3 catches the machine's snake hand weapon that leaves 104 seconds of operation time on the left arm. It does get pushed back due to the kinetic force, but not by much. Now it is time for Tobia to strike back. At least, such would be the case if the boy had experience fighting under gravity, with the intended leap turning into a tumble and sending him into the trees. Due to this unfamiliarity, running away is out of question, which means he'll have to take them head on. As such, the X3's pilot grabs a pair of heat daggers, and stands up to face his enemies. The Death Kill's formation draws near. It is three on one, once again, though this time Toby is fairly confident he has a chance. He is now surrounded by the enemy machines within a sea of trees. The next one to attack is Barnes in the Tortuga, whose drill-like hammer hand comes swinging in Toby's direction, but the boy evades it, making the attack connect to a nearby tree. Even the pirate kid is surprised by the ease at which he dodged the hit, but he can't dwell on it too long, since another strike is coming his way, courtesy of Giri. The timing on that one is off as well, allowing Tobia to simply skip over the beam cutter with ease. This allows the boy to continue his train of thought as well as prepare for an attack on the part of Rosemary's Abijo. 
The barrage from the machine's needle gun is largely caught by the trees, and the pirate kid finally comes to a realization. He's not the only one to be lacking in ground combat experience. Meaning that if he is not used to gravity, neither are they. At this point, Giri is getting impatient. And as it turns out, his oddball of a machine has a bird mode. It even has a high output mega particle cannon, which it promptly fires in Tobias' general direction, burning a small hole into the ground and setting the surrounding trees ablaze. The old man observes the scene from a distance, still heading away in the stolen car with Pera and Bernadette in tow. He remarks on how much of a waste it is to burn parts of the forest like this and continues speeding away. As Tobia regains footing after a dodge, he strengthens his resolve. The enemy has broken up its formation by themselves. It's something they shouldn't be accustomed to either, possibly leaving the boy an opening to capitalize on. X3 proceeds to hose down the Quaverse with its machine guns, which, while not too effective due to their low power, gets Geary to regain some confidence, ordering his team to surround and attack the Gundam. Suffice to say, Tobia counted on this, opting to channel his inner Kukuru's Doan for the second time in this manga and chucking a giant flaming log at Geary. As it lands, he tosses another one, confusing the Jovian pilot. While the Quaverse didn't sustain any tangible damage, the pirate kid has accomplished another goal, getting the little red bastard off balance. It's something Giri acknowledges way too late, at which point the X3 has already caught his machine by the tail, dragging it down to the ground. Tobia then plants his machine's feet, after which he proceeds to sharply yank the mobile suit of his adversary. The Quaverse and its pilot are in for a world of hurt, or more aptly, a world of spin as the Jovian pilot quickly experiences the meaning of centrifugal force. The spinning continues, increasing in pace, and if by this point Kiri wasn't about to puke all over the cockpit, he certainly will now. Rosemary tries to close in and help out, but the moment she does so, the Quo Verze is thrown at her at a speed that would make any hammer throw champion break a sweat. Having knocked out the Beho, Tobia approaches with a pair of heat daggers and skewers the damn thing. At the same time, he is nice enough to give Rosemary a heads up that he will, in fact, dare her mobile suit to smithereens. Once he's clear, the boy absolutely delivers on his promise, by turning the Abijo into Swiss cheese, using every single built-in gun the machine has at hand, i.e. all six of them. This leaves the Tortuga, which opts for a ranged approach, using the beam guns on the back. It's not too much of a hassle to deal with though, and Tobia manages to pull back towards an escape pod which was left over from their arrival to the Blue Planet. Of course, the pilot of the Tortuga follows close. Funnily enough, Barnes does suspect Tobia that he might use it defensively, but since the Tortuga is a hulking behemoth, he decides to go through with the attack anyway. There's a little thing he wasn't really privy to, the Muramasa Blaster, a sizable sword which the X3 brought along on its first sortie, and which has currently pierced the Tortuga's armor. While this is nowhere near close to being a lethal hit, it got the Tortuga to release its adhesive, attaching it to the now vacant yet still bulky escape pod. Now rendered mostly immobile, the Jovian Giant's pilot can only look as the X3 approaches from the side, beam saber in hand. Tobia's machine jumps into the air, pointing the beam saber diagonally downwards, stabbing the Tortuga through one of its side vents and punching the weapon's handle to penetrate the armor even more. At this point, Tobia is getting pretty exhausted but at the same time hopes that at the very least, Lieutenant Barnes is still in one piece. As he approaches the wreckage of the Tortuga, a red, whip-like shape emerges from the foliage, catching the X3 within its grasp. It's Geary, and he's got some unfinished business to tend to. While both the Abijo and Tortuga are in no shape to keep fighting, Geary caught the pirate kid off guard with his coverse. However, there's another silhouette amidst the trees rushing towards their location in the burning forest. As you might have guessed, there is something vaguely familiar about this silhouette, with Tobia still unable to break out of the snake hand's grip. Giri taunts him about how the boy's concern for Barnes's life had cost him a tactical advantage. At the same time, it is quite apparent that for the Jovian pilot, retreat isn't really an option. Having lost two of his squadmates and sustained some injuries, there is no way he could return empty-handed. As such, all Giri can do at the moment is fight. And fight he does, robbing the X3 of any potential means of escape or retaliation, before pointing the Quaverse's beam cannon directly at the machine's back, seemingly at Giri's mercy. 
The boy suddenly hears a voice telling him to regain his composure and lower the x 3s upper thrusters. Tobia does so just in time, giving the Quaverse a good whack and redirecting the beam cannon's barrel towards the ground as it fires. That was close. Way too close. Now that the pirate kid has regained his footing, he realizes that he has heard this voice before. In the meantime, the figure we've seen a glimpse of earlier finally emerges from the foliage and almost immediately attacks the Quaverse with a whip of some sorts. Giri's machine manages to respond in kind, slashing at the cloaked adversary. At this point, it's glaringly obvious that the mobile suit he's up against is none other than the Crossbone Gundam X1 Kai. Initially, the Jovian pilot isn't really buying it, considering that the last time he saw the X1's pilot, the man was seemingly out cold and six feet under. He also tries to hit it using the head-mounted Mega Particle Cannon. To Geary's surprise, the X1 Kai leaps into the air, dodging the attack and ditching the cloak to obscure his line of sight. Using this distraction as an opening, the machine also takes out another web and goes for a swift downward strike. Not falling behind at all, the Quaverse unleashes an attack of its own. As the hits land and the dust settles, we can see that this exchange definitely went in the X1's favor. Giri's machine now spots two deep cuts in its torso, while its opponent sustained a mere scratch. However, this is nowhere near the end of it. With a single brisk movement, the X1 Kai starts up the screw whips, mangling the living fuck out of the Quaverse as the drill-like tips of the weapon start to spin. Giri does manage to escape the blender though, as the X1 stands above the smoldering mechanical remains of Giri's machine. Tobia has the sudden urge to see the face of the pilot who saved him, hoping to see a friend that he seemingly lost. To his utter astonishment, the cockpit opens, revealing a familiar figure. It's Kincaid. Kincaid now. He's alive and kicking, but definitely not in the best shape, with the pirates telling Tobia that it's been barely four days since he was in critical condition. Almost immediately, he's inundated with questions, courtesy of the boy. However, before the two get to talk, it's made clear that they still have a thing to take care of. Obviously, the thing in question is Geary being a spoil sport. Despite his injuries, the new tap from Jupiter is still standing, brandishing a handgun in their general direction. In case you forgot, he's the protege of Professor Karras, and as he stated, he can't really go back empty-handed. Being backed into the proverbial corner, he decides to blow his brains out. The gun is pointed at his temple, leaving the two space pirates powerless to stop him as a shot rings out. However, instead of making an improv Jackson Pollock painting, the pistol's barrel is quickly pushed away at the last second by a third party. That's right, Lieutenant Barnes actually made it out alive, albeit barely, slumping down on the ground shortly after foiling Geary's suicide attempt. In the meantime, a set of helicopters, which bear some resemblance to the Boeing Vertol CH-46 Sea Knight, have been dispatched to quell the fires prompting Tobia and others to move out. The two Gundams end up heading towards a wooden cottage nearby, where an old lumberjack and a former ship captain await their arrival. We get a nice shot of the X-1 Kai, as Kincaid and Bera finally reunite, and we finally get to see the Gundam pilot in full. His face is mostly covered in bandages, save for the left eye and the mouth. He's also got a metal arm now, groovy. I probably don't need to mention this, but the movie Army of Darkness came out in 1993, not even two years before Crossbone's 1994 debut in the December issue of Shonen Ace. Could be a coincidence, but Hasegawa seems to be quite the movie buff, so I wouldn't put it past him. Regardless, even in the less than stellar state Kincaid is in, the two are quite glad to see one another again, with the former reassuring Barra that he'll be fine. He'll walk it off. She hugs him, and Bernadette can't help but shed a tear of happiness, not to be left out. The old lumberjack gets a peck on the cheek. Meanwhile, in the wooden cottage, which turns out to have belonged to the old man's friend, the Death Guild team members rest, recovering from their wounds. Lieutenant Barnes Gernsback is in the worst shape of the three, lying on the floor as the TV plays in the background. After a while, Tobia enters with a bowl of water. Finally having a moment of respite, Barnes laments the lot of being a soldier, Especially so for the Jupiter Empire, considering that regardless of the nature of Dogati's whims, he and his compatriots are ultimately beholden to them. He also remarks that if the previous fight were to play out in space, all three Jovians would have perished. So in a twist of irony, they were saved by the same Earth they were ordered to burn down. 
Tobias attention suddenly turns to the TV, where a distressed newscaster announces that from the 48 hours the Jupiter Empire gave them, less than 24 remain. With the Federation's major military bases largely out of commission, their Federation Space Force has no hope for further reinforcements. Barnes mentions that the Jupiter's class ship of the Jovian fleet has a weak spot between the blocks 8 and 9. While the soldier doesn't think their chances of success are anything to write home about, Kincaid now retorts this assertion by barging in with a plan. As it turns out, the Gundam pilot has already gotten in contact with his Crossbone Vanguard crewmates. Not to mention, with both the X3 and the X1 Kai operational, they have quite the trump card up their sleeve. In early morning hours, they depart, with the pirate kid awaiting the upcoming battle, wrapped in a cozy blanket and in deep slumber. Suffice to say, Toby is not an early bird. In a race against time, the space pirates make their way to the Federation's base, number 117. Back at the main attack fleet, Krugs Dogati laughs at the currently toothless efforts to oppose them, going so far as to dismiss the Federation attacks as mere cannon fodder. He states that the missile attacks against the Jupiteris are slow enough to be intercepted. Professor Karras, who is standing by his side, seems completely unfazed by the fact that the Death Gale team didn't return, simply remarking that if they truly perished, they were simply too weak for the task they've been given. He also gets a new type squadron under his command. This will be important later on. Zabine is right next to Karras. See, by this point, even Dogati is curious as to what Zabine's endgame is here. Considering that the Jovian despot wishes to see the blue planet ablaze. What Blondie wants though is fairly straightforward. He wishes for a world based on the principles of aristocracy i.e. the rule of nobility. This is fairly consistent with his reverence for Dogati's regime, as the sheer destructive power at the man's disposal does make him someone Zabine finds worthy of following. The Jovian despot simply replies that in all honesty he could care less about what happens to Earth after his plan is enacted, so depending on who's left alive, both the one-eyed soldier and the crooked professor can stake a claim on it. We also see Eos Nix, the ship Sheridan is staying at. The ship's captain is currently deep in thought, ruminating over the current situation. She is aware of Dogati's flippant disregard for the state of Earth, and in a sense, he has become an entity that is entirely disconnected from the Blue Planet. Worse yet, while she knows that he is a threat, Sheridan is also powerless to stop him. Down on Earth, a Federation base seems to be under attack. The ground forces, mostly composed of the RGM-109 heavy guns, are taking fire while the Federation officers scramble to track down the assailants. It's not Jupiter forces, no, this is the work of someone else. That's right, it's the pirates. Using Sinri's mass production model, the XM-10 Flint, the former Mother Vanguard crewmen make good use of its all-round specs to overwhelm the station force, with Old Man Umon commanding the machine's performance. This particular base doesn't have any notable infrastructure, not even large transports or shuttles that were present on the bases that the Jupiter Empire targeted first. However, as Kincaid states, there's a bunch of solid fuel rockets from a previous era just lying around, and those should be good enough. With that, the two Gundams of the Crossbone Vanguard descend from the transport ship onto the base, and Kincaid decides to finally explain how he made it out. When his X-1 Kai got decapitated by Zabine and kicked towards the Earth's atmosphere by the same culprit, he turned on the mobile suit's beam shield making a successful atmospheric entry without any external help, effectively proving a theory that beam shields can do that firsthand. Having touched down at the EFF base, he continues. As it turns out, the angle of the X2 Kai's attack was off by just enough to leave him with severe burns and costing him his right arm instead of completely evaporating him. It is thanks to the fact that Sinri's Earth branch didn't want to lose a loyal customer that he got patched up and nursed from being barely alive to being alive enough to pilot a Gundam again. In the meantime, the Federation garrison, taken completely aback by the surprise attack, decided to surrender, which in turn allows Tobia to rendezvous with the former Zondo gay pilots, Jared, Yona and Umon. There's also the rocket that Kincaid mentioned earlier, and the Gundam pilot wastes no time proceeding to elaborate on his plan. In theory, if he got away with going down to Earth using nothing but a beam shield, the space pirates should be able to go the opposite way with nothing but beam shields and the aforementioned rockets. By the time they get the rockets set up, the sun's already down. Bernadette runs into Tobia, as he's typing on a very 90s looking laptop. 
Having received an email, the boy explains that he is writing a response to Barrow's cousin, Sheridan Rona. In her message, she is still clinging onto her usual spiel about new types, about how they are supposed to usher in a new age of mankind and such, though she does concede that Tobia should be allowed to use his abilities in the upcoming battle. As we all know, the pirate kid is still not on board, with the boy stating that he'll strive to accomplish his goal without quote-unquote becoming a new type. Bernadette is dealing with stuff of her own, and upon Tobias' inquiry, she reveals the source of her concern. After witnessing Dogati's cruelty in person, she suspects that her father is long gone, and that the Jupiter forces are being puppeteered by a mere facsimile. At this point though, it's fairly obvious that the girl is having a hard time coming to terms with the fact that her father could be capable of such things. She asks Tobia to stop the man's reign, to which the boy reassures her that he'll do exactly just that. At sunrise, everything is ready to go. Vera asks Kincaid whether he's taking Tobia too, but given how stubborn the pirate kid is, we already know the answer to that. She also tries to dissuade the Gundam pilot from going, since it is a dangerous mission, but she knows all too well that Kincaid will not relent either. He still has a duty to accomplish in order to create a world where Barrow Rona can be Cecily Fairchild again. The two share a kiss, and the rockets prepare for a liftoff. There's about six hours left before the impending attack, and on his way to his machine, Tobia hands Barrow a floppy disk, having finished his reply message. The boy then reassures her that he'll watch Kincaid's back, so there's no need to worry. As the Crossbone Vanguard finally takes off, EO Snix receives a letter. Its initial paragraph reads as such. Can you walk 12 kilometers on a mountain road in a single day? It's very simple and to the point. For the general space noid sensibilities, that's a hefty distance. But the humanity has possessed the ability to walk that distance from the very beginning. Toby also asserts that the awakening of new types was simply an environmental adaptation, not some sort of higher degree of human evolution. At their core, they remain human long before any sort of social renaissance comes from the proliferation of new types, it is up to people themselves to step up to the plate and bring the conflict to an end. He will see to it with his very own two hands. As he dives into the starry expanse, he states that if there is a god out there, the pirate kid certainly wouldn't mind a helping hand. Near the Jupiter fleet, the remnants of the deployed Earth Federation space forces keep engaging the Jupiterist class choosing to fight until the bitter end. Just like Harrison Madden states, they've been had, with the despair-filled atmosphere being underscored by Dogati's laughter. However, the crew of the Jupiter suddenly spots multiple targets approaching from underneath. They're headed for the fleet's main ship, and despite their speed, these don't seem to be missiles. They're mobile suits. The Crossbone Vanguard has finally arrived. The fact of the matter is that the Jovians have spread themselves too thin having moved their troops to the front and sides, which means they now have to move them in order to try and intercept the rapidly approaching mobile suits. At this point, the former Zondo gay pilots detach from one of the rockets to cover Kincaid and Tobia, using their flints. As their two Gundams close in towards the Jupiterus, the Jovian forces finally arrive, nearly overwhelming the flint team and making a dash towards the X-1 Kai and the X-3. According to Kincaid, even at their current speed, the two pirates probably won't get close enough to their target before they're effectively surrounded. Suddenly, the approaching Batalas start to erupt into flames as they're peppered by a concentrated barrage of beam shots. The Federation forces, composed of multiple heavy guns and Model 143 balls, led by Harrison Madden and his blue Gundam F-91, are here to help out. As Kincaid's crossbone Gundam X-1 Kai brushes past him, he also tells the pirate Dio that after all of this is over, he'll even get them a good lawyer. Having finally reached the target, the two Gundams ditched the rockets, with both Kincaid and Tobia loading a special explosive payload into their Zanbusters. They head upwards, around the large metal beams. They line up a shot and fire. The response is almost immediate, with the resulting explosion engulfing a huge chunk of the Jupiteris and causing substantial damage to it. It doesn't just end there, as the explosion causes a chain reaction shredding some of the ship's adjacent sections to ribbons, alongside nearby Jovian mobile suits. This ultimately culminates with the entire ship being effectively bisected. Not bad for a pair of small-sized nuclear warheads, considering that the damn thing was about 2 kilometers long. Krux Dogati isn't too pleased with this. The ship is in shambles, the comms are down, and the stationed crew is in panic. As such, he is heading out himself. Not by himself, mind you. 
his posse of clones is going alongside him as well. Outside of the Jupiteris, the pirate kid is beside himself with excitement. They did it. However, Kincaid knows full well that this isn't over. Not yet. Dougherty is still alive. They haven't dealt the finishing blow. That being said, crippling the Jupiteris gave them a solid opening, which is something the two Gunner pilots have now set out to capitalize on. In the frenzy of combat, Tobia suddenly finds himself separated from his compatriot. At the same time, he notices a set of blurry silhouettes slicing nearby Federation heavy guns into pieces. Almost instinctively, the boy rushes for cover, dodging the attack, and he quickly realizes what he's up against. The silhouettes he saw earlier were razor-sharp wires, and a familiar voice confirms his suspicion. His opponent is none other than Professor Damien Karras, piloting an EMA-07 Nautilus. Suffice to say, Tobia isn't particularly glad about the encounter and the professor's casual tone. There is, however, one thing Karras says that sticks out. Taking a page from the laws of the jungle, he states that the world is shaped by those strong enough to enact their will, and if the pirate kid wants to stop the professor's efforts, he has to go through him, as well as the new type squadron Karras brought alongside him. Back on the Jupiteris, one of the sections opens up, revealing a being of gargantuan stature. Emerging from the ship is the EMA-10 Divinidad Mobile Armor. Unfortunately, it is not alone, with more of these units climbing out as well. To rub more salt into the wound, there are seven of them in total, slowly ascending from the heavily damaged Jupiteris class. The eighth one is heading for Earth, with Dougherty in tow. As the mobile armors fly out, Harrison orders all units to commence their attack on the Jupiter Giants. Suffice to say, these are gonna be a handful, especially considering their size, with one Divinidad unit towering over the Federation's club-class ship and breaking it in two with ease using its massive arm. Kinkate observes the rampage from the distance. By his estimation, if even one of these things reached Earth, they're pretty much done for. As such, he turns the thrusters to the max and starts heading towards the mobile armor. However, there is another problem on the horizon. Zabine in his X2 Kai. The eyepatch sporting blondie crosses Kincaid's path as the beam zambers of the two Gundams start to clash. It appears that both Kincaid and Zabine have some unfinished business. The fight itself quickly becomes increasingly melee heavy as the duo starts to exchange blows. Tobia has his hands full as well, with the Nautilus and the new type squadron putting him on the back foot. Of course, that doesn't stop Professor Karras from reiterating on his old shtick as he watches Tobia dodging the attacks from the mass production Quaversace piloted by his underlings. Notably, he doubles down on the whole next stage of evolution thing. However, the pirate kid has a retort, a big fuck-off sword. With just a few swings, the boy decimates the Jovian new type squadron, all the while calling Karras on his usual bullshit. The Nautilus tries to intercept the X3 with wire shots, but its pilot dodges it with ease and closes in on the mobile armor. He burrows the beam blades into the Nautilus, slicing a chunk out of the mechanized marine mollusk. With the heavily damaged mobile armor drifting away, Karras applauds the boy's performance from the now partially exposed cockpit. As the pirate kid watches the barely operational machine, one of the mass production Quaverse pilots tries to shoot the X3 using a beam gun, but something stops him dead in his tracks. With his dying breath, Professor Karras pretty much euthanizes the sore loser, laughing that a loser ought not to stand in the winner's path. After that, the Nautilus explodes leaving Tobia speechless. As for the Divinidad units, they start releasing myriads of small feather-like modules, which start putting a dent in the Federation's numbers. They also have medium-sized head-mounted beam cannons, and at this point, the Federation grunts come to a consensus that their chances are starting to look pretty bleak. There is, however, something that suddenly turns the tide. Reinforcements. The colonies have mobilized their forces, be they ships, mobile suits, Everything that could move and hold a gun was sent there. Surprisingly enough, even Sheridan Rona's Eos Nix is seen in the approaching colossal mass. Now the shoe is on the other foot, with the colony force quickly overwhelming the seven deployed mobile armors. Watching the skirmish, Jared, Yona and Umon remark on the situation, and despite sustaining some damage early on, they decide to rush in and help out as well. With the seven units accounted for, that leaves number eight. Tobia can't sense anything from the bio-brain units in the first seven, which means the last one is piloted by Dougherty himself. Almost as if he heard the boy's thoughts, Dougherty deploys in a spherical capsule from the damaged Jupiteris 
and the Pirate Kid gives chase in his Crossbone Gundam X3. The fight between Kincaid and Zabine is still going on, with both of their respective machines being down to nothing but a single heat dagger. Both Gundams go in for one final strike. The blades connect. The X1 Kai caught Zabine's dagger, using the machine's faceplate to catch it. As for the X2 Kai, it got shanked right in the cockpit, which in short means Blondie got skewered. As he lays there, dying, he laments how he could have ruled the world of his own, with Kincaid bluntly calling out his hubris. Now if you've seen the F91 movie, this is a climax to the somewhat brief yet quite intriguing characterization of Zabine Sharu. He was there as one of Mitra Rona's top guys, and a big proponent of his ideals. Hell, he was around when the Crossbone Vanguard was founded. I was deeply involved in the formation of the Crossbone Vanguard. I know that neither Maitza nor Iron Mass would allow personal feelings to interfere with official ideology. And neither would I. He's also not a big fan of people being ruled by their feelings, viewing them as nothing more than subhuman vermin. Anna Marie, I always taught you that people who can't deal with their passions are trash. Ultimately though, he was a man of contradictions. Whatever goals he set out to strive towards, he abandoned for his own selfish ambitions. Not to mention that after his betrayal he became a slave to his grudge against Kincaid, and died the death of a hypocrite. With Zabine out of the picture, Kincaid starts looking for Tobia, quickly spotting a silhouette approaching a large shape that's descending towards Earth. Standing on the capsule, the pilot of the X-3 stares down the towering mobile armor before him, preparing for one last fight. As Kincaid, Tobia and Dogati descend into the atmosphere, Bernadette spots the outline of the capsule, mistaking it for a shooting star and wishing for the pirate kid's safe return. And so it begins, a single mobile suit standing in the way of Dogati's will. As the Jovian despot laughs at the boy's efforts, Tobia remarks that at this point the pilot of the mobile armor might not even be human anymore, especially considering all that he's done up to this point. The Divinidad tries to swipe him with its claws, but they're way too sluggish to feasibly hit the X-3. As he dodges the attack, the pirate kid tries to come up with a plan to take the mechanical Goliath down, considering that there's a non-zero chance that it has multiple nuclear reactors all over its body, and if one of them blows, a chain reaction is imminent. Not to mention the fallout. Following closely behind the capsule is Kincaid and his X-1 Kai, remarking that despite his best efforts, he can't completely catch up to them. The roles have now reversed, with Kincaid being Tobias' backup this time around. At this point, both the X-3 and the mobile armor finish their fall and get plunged into the sea. The pirate kid suddenly comes up with a plan. He swings the X-3's large sword at the mobile armor's leg. It gets sliced clean off as the boy proceeds to brief us on his plan. Simply put, if he can't risk cutting into the mobile armor's limbs, he can always cut them off. On top of that, he's at an advantage, since Dogati seems to be lacking in as far as piloting acumen goes. Back in space, the Divinidad units start to succumb to the onslaught of mobile suits. With one of them getting blown into bits already, it seems that on this front the battle is coming to an end. The giant mobile armors, bested by nothing but a bunch of Jagans, Denanzons and Zakurao mobile suits. As it turns out, Dogati didn't really count on the colony forces mobilizing that soon, so this didn't only throw a wrench into his plans. It bisected the plans and fed them into a woodchipper. However, down on Earth, the fighting is nowhere near over. Even without one leg, the Divinidad number 8 is still a handful. While dodging its beams, Tobia can't help but question the twisted rationale behind Dogati's plan. The Jovian despot starts to rant about how he built the Empire from nothing, just as the pirate kid takes out the other leg. Apparently over the span of 70 years, he had managed to establish a somewhat self-sustaining nation with little to no external aid and all he got from the Federation was an attempt to get him hitched into a political marriage. That is how Bernadette was born, through this bond imposed on him, to rub the salt into the wound. Dogati's wife was not a resentful person, quite the contrary. The mobile armor loses an arm, it is this warmth, coming from someone raised on the blue planet, that started to fuel Dogati's sheer, undiluted hatred towards Earth. As the mobile armor floats upwards, he blatantly admits that his ramblings about the planet not being necessary for the mankind's future was nothing but set dressing. He's doing this for nothing more than petty revenge. Turns out, the Divinidad is packing nukes, 16 in total. Of course, Tobia doesn't waste a single second 
converging his beam sword's output into a single blade, and emerging from the water as well. In one quick swing, he takes out all the warheads, catching Dogati by surprise. The boy remarks that ultimately, Dogati remains human. A twisted wretch, but still a human, not some kind of a new being. His train of thought, however, is interrupted by Divinidad destroying his sword with a beam shot and revealing a much bigger mega particle cannon mounted in the head of the mobile armor. In a feat of quick thinking, Tobia rushes forth. He's got no weapons left, but he's certainly not out of options. With the X3 jammed into the mobile armor's cannon, he sets both of the arm mounted eye fields to maximum output and ejects out in his machine's proprietary core fighter as the mega particle cannon fires. The beam gets mostly deflected towards its originator, with the rest of the shot hitting the X3 from point blank. The resulting explosion takes out the cannon, rendering it inoperative alongside most of the mobile armor's head. Tobia and the core fighter does get pushed away by the blast, with King Kate catching him, before the aircraft could manage to hit the waves. As for Dogati, he's getting consumed by flames which engulfed his cockpit during the explosion. We also get a good look at the full scale of the damage caused by Tobia's resourceful move with the X3, and suffice to say, it is fairly substantial. Now mortally wounded, Dogati is in absolute delirium, daydreaming about burning down the blue planet. However, King Kate doesn't think the man should be allowed to get any solace from this delusion and reaches for the screw whip. After a short windup, he pulverizes Dogati into paint. Good riddance. The mobile armor sinks into the sea as Kincaid and Tobia start making their way ashore. It's finally over. In the end, the pirate kid was vindicated in the notion that humanity at large is what will bring about change. It is people first and foremost who brought this war to an end. The following day, the two Gundam pilots and the rest of the Crossbone Vanguard gather around the X-1 Kai. Even Captain Olmo is there. Vera takes off the bandages off of Kincaid's face revealing his right eye and a shallow scar going from his forehead to his cheek. Almost as an act of passing the torch, King Kid leaves the Gundam to Tobia. The kid is still set on being a space pirate, so doing so would be for the best. As for King Kid himself, he pretty much retires. He's decided to settle down on Earth alongside the woman he loves. King Kid's fight is over. It is time for Seabook to return. Vera finally goes back to her Sicily moniker as she embraces Seabook. Later that day, the Crossbone Vanguard crew lines up to see them off. It is that day the two regained their names and left to live somewhere nice and quiet. As for Tobia, he will see to it that the name Crossbone Gundam won't ever fade away. However, the story of the Pirate Kid doesn't end here. Quite the contrary, but that will have to wait until the day I talk about Skullheart. Regardless, the 1990s run of Crossbone Gundam is a great Gundam entry. Despite not having as much Tomino involvement as most mainline UC series, it builds on the legacy of its predecessors while doing its own thing. Just like in both Gundam 0079 and F91, the bloated, faceless and overbearing nature of Earth Federation is what ultimately pushed people towards similarly flawed regimes, such as the largely jingoistic monarchy of the Zabis and Giran's identitarian offshoot of it, the Rona family's cosmo-aristocracy, as well as the collectivist top-down planned economy under Dogati. Some things just don't change. As for the new type aspect, in this tale, Sheridan Rona seems to serve the role of a more naive counterpart to Zeon Zoom Daikun. While correct in the notion that humans being will, at least in Gundam, gravitate towards gaining new type aptitude once they move to space, she didn't really know people and was at least initially a spoiled brat that just kept repeating talking points. Her eventual realization that mankind is, on some level, still connected to Earth is an echo of the ending of Shark's counterattack, namely the Axis Shock, where even the Zeon grunts helped push the asteroid away. Not to mention, Umon's line about new types in one of the earlier volumes reflected the general paradigm around new types at this point in the timeline, mirroring what we see in both F91 and Victory. Following the original Gundam score themes of freedom and duty, the protagonist Tobia Aranax rises to the occasion. Same goes for the colony forces, which acted entirely by themselves, using whatever they had on hand to stop the mobile armors, be them new types or not. To reiterate on my previous point, the Jupiter Empire at this point of the timeline is the most ruthless faction not named Zanskar Empire, with their disregard for human life giving Titans and Giran a run for their money. Dogati's plan to destroy Earth as the idol of humanity, plentifulness and freedom 
does have parallels to various repressive regimes that desired to destroy or subjugate the world outside of their domain, either functionally or in the minds of their own citizens. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. The Jovian dictatorship's support for warmongers and divisive destabilizing movements does also mimic a modus operandi of such factions. Another neat thing is that Hasegawa seems to be a movie buff, naming Tobia after the protagonist of 20,000 Leagues Below the Sea. Damien Karras shares his name with the exorcist character, and even in the later entries, such as Skull Art and Steel 7, you get references to stuff like Dr. Strangelove and the 1980s Tarzan movie, as well as Seven Samurai. But that's enough of me gushing about that. I had a lot of fun making this, and I hope it shows. In due time, you'll get Skull Heart in part 4. But until then, thanks for watching. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And this is Shirtlad, signing out. I didn't like how the audio was fucked up, so I tried it again. Edonax, my boy. I've taken 200 milligrams of ketamine, and I'm about to die. <laughs> Kincaid, you're in big trouble, mister. You better atone for them sins. You gonna go straight to hell. Mm -hmm. Zucchini! And what have you brought me? A five dollar Walgreens gift card! We gotta use this chance to beat that boy left and right and ups, ups, down, all around. Just let him know. Alright. What do you think you are? Huh? You got the home field advantage. Where you from? Cadia? Huh? You're not in Cadia anymore, kid! That was a Warhammer reference, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is all going in the bloopers, right? <laughs>